it's spinning we right are now. we are live amazing so uh <laughs> i love this picture of her yeah that's a, she's she's an amazing lady so i'm i'm excited to talk about her uh hello everybody this is the second book club uh episode and this is my thanksgiving episode and i'm very thankful for the lady that we're talking about today she uh has taught me a lot and made my life a lot easier and uh made my back hurt a lot less is let the let the worms do the turning is something i like to say so uh i hope everybody enjoys this as much as i hope too and i'd like to start off by uh everybody that's here live thank you for uh being here but uh everybody that's uh catching this later on it would be if you don't know anything about Mary Applehoff or that you haven't read this book, it would be a good idea to go watch uh, Worm Mania on YouTube. It's a it's a beautiful little uh, video. Uh, she's she's an amazing person for making this. It's something that you would have seen in school. Yeah, this is uh, that picture in the middle is a clip from it. Uh, she's the worm woman. So, uh, yeah. Go go check that out, and then come back come back to this, and then uh, you'll see why after watching that uh, why we like her so much, Allison and I. As Allison is uh, when she gets set up, she'll she'll be coming on here, and uh, she actually met Mary a while back. So as unfortunately Mary's dead, or uh, so it would be nice if we could talk to her. But we're gonna we're gonna talk about her, and like I said, be grateful for Mary Applehoff and what she what she gave the world with this book right here. We're, we're talking about Worms Eat My Garbage. And there's another picture of her. And it, uh, on the back, like most books, it tells you a little bit about the author. And uh, she was a uh, science teacher. And uh, she wrote this book in a way for kids to grasp. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, it's no pamphlet. It's a, it's a nice size book and it's full of science. She's an actual scientist. It's not just some lady with a uh, worm bin that got excited and decided to just write a book. She's actually, she was in, uh, this is, th what's, a, what's so cool about this thing is what she did was, uh, it's designed to where uh, a kid could read this and get it and be excited about it. And also, one of her goals was to make more people like uh, Alice and Jack, the the lady that's going to be joining us in a in a little while. Uh, she wanted to make more uh, vermophiles. Uh, she says several times in this book that it's a it's an open field. There's more to know about worms than what we know. Like we don't. It's it's just like soil. We don't know enough about it, so it's a, it's an easy field to get into, and there's a lot of research to do. So. Yeah, uh, it's it's a what I like most about it is that it's a uh, like a, a beginning gardening book for you, somebody that has never like planted anything or uh, has ever tried to grow a plant could read just the beginning of this book when she's explaining what worms do and they're going to most likely be successful with that, their first planting if they because she does a really good job of explaining that the the worms making that all of that topsoil is, and all of that bacteria that they're releasing in their poop is what's actually growing the plants and, and not not you it's it's what the worms are doing and a lot of a lot of this channel you see a lot of it talking a lot about amendments and cover crops and uh uh, mulching and stuff like that. It's really just protecting all of that stuff in there. And I, uh, that's in the soil, I mean. And uh, it, uh, I feel kind of, uh, I guess, uh, I don't, uh, guilty. I, I, I Sometimes I feel guilty watching this channel because my soil is so good and I really don't need to do what I do with worms. It's just like kind of a icing on the cake kind of thing for me. But I see some of the stuff that uh, people are dealing with out West and uh, they like, you don't have anything to grow out of. Uh, I can see why you all are so focused on all of the building of the, the soil and the bacteria and really getting everything uh, because you, 
a lot of the places out there, uh, sand and clay and just it's it's tough. There's not a lot of organic matter in a lot of the places. So it's it's, it's fun watching everybody out there like winning these battles. Uh, the guy uh, the, that runs Build a Soil, he's one of those guys. He's helping people out in Colorado do the same kind of thing. It's just uh, winning these uh, battles against the what nature has given you. So and this this book worms eat my garbage is it's not all about gardening is she she's mainly like uh she's her main focus was recycling uh, you can tell uh, the way that it's it's written is it's just she wanted to get people more into recycling and the uh the gardening is a way of her to sell way for her to sell it the fishing worms is a way for her to sell it because it's it's kind of hard to uh, get people to buy into the idea of, of having basically a rotten vegetable box in their kitchen with worms decomposing and uh, all of the fungus and stuff that that starts in that and then you uh fruit fly problems and there's a, there's and she she talks about all of that and little tips on how to deal with all of that stuff so as uh uh, I also am thankful for uh, Clackamas Coot with uh, this worm thing. Is I, I took what I learned from Mary in this uh, book, and I didn't read this entire thing, but it's, it's, I, I know I've read enough of it to where it, it works for me. So uh, I, I, I had an indoor worm bin that I started at first, and I, I was digging through the shed and trying to find that thing, and I was going to show you like how how I started off, and then I showed. Peter and everybody else several times what I'm doing now. And that's what I was talking about with Coot is Clackamas Coot's a worm dude. And uh, he has saved my back as well. So it's, it's, I took the basic science that Mary taught me and then uh, took that and combined it with uh, Coot's years of expertise and just me being kind of a, a lazy dude. Uh, I, you getting older you don't want to be turning compost piles all the time so i decided to do this large outdoor compost pile that she she mentions how to do this in this book and uh coot goes through step by step on the uh when he was on one of the kiss podcasts uh i highly recommend you go back and watch that because i, I learned i've learned a lot from that man over the years just reading him on the forums and stuff like that but uh that that podcast was really informative for me as yeah that's pretty that's a pretty cool picture uh, that's yeah that's what mary was into is doing doing that kind of thing so i see that we had allison but she max headroomed out on us it looks <laughs> like <laughs> allison you can hear us right i can can you see me okay uh we, no it, it, no <laughs> that's but weird i see myself okay Oh uh, really? That's really strange. Yeah. Are you on your phone or your computer? Phone. Uh. Hmm. Should I try computer instead? Yeah. If you're home, maybe jump on the computer. Okay. And I'll I'll email the link to you. Okay. All right. Bye. We'll try again. Thank you for your patience with technical difficulties. No problem. Uh, has, I have no room to be impatient. That's for sure. <laughs> so. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go so, rambling so, on about well, this. No, no, no. Thing but before you ramble, the most critical <laughs> thing I think everyone wants to know is that bowl that took you a couple minutes to pack. What is it? Oh, it's the the Black Lights eighty eight man. It's 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 all that I've got for the time being. It says I'll I'll have some other stuff soon, but this is this has been my staple for a while. It's a, it's it's pretty good smoke. It's pine bud, and it's got it's got some legs to it, and I uh, don't get burnt out on it like I do a lot of Afghans. So yeah, this I really like this stuff. So uh, yeah, props to uh, Bob Hempel and Hannah Bolt and all those people at Coastal that went through those those plants and Duke for putting that 88 back cross out there because it has really saved my ass for a while now. It's it's good stuff. I just packed up a bunch of that stuff as I was gonna uh, donate it. James Bean said that there was some something had happened again. So the but uh, I never heard anything back. So I've got some. Anybody wants some of that stuff, I'll give it to you. I have, <laughs> it's yeah, that, that, that's one of the things. So I just finished growing out the uh, the uh, bobcat spray, and uh, I was oh, that's do that finished. Next. Yeah, that, that's already finished. Wow. Uh, well, yeah, I guess that was a while ago when you played it. So when uh, when did you pull it? Like three days ago. 
All right, so yeah. That that that, that was the one with all those worm, uh, those caterpillar shots. Oh no shit, <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. Did, did you get anything pissy? Uh yeah no that, I mean so we we would smell like as we were harvesting we'd smell different kind of you know colas and and buds and you know some of them smelled more kind of fruity and then others definitely had kind of the pissy you know and, and I, I I had you know cats growing up and Tom has a dog and a cat and uh, we were both like I smell it uh, it was cool. Uh, good deal. That's it. The thing is, it's holding on to it. That's what I was trying to talk about the other day with the skunk is you can find it. You people, a lot of people find it, but holding it is the thing. It, is it just, it wisps away. So, it, you know, that's anyway, won't we'll bring up old conversations. Welcome, Allison. Let me, let me okay, highlight so now you. you. can see me and hear me. Thank you. for. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, that's, All right. It's nice meeting you. I really enjoyed the, uh, vermicompost conversation that you held on here i guess it was about a year or so ago now so a, and that's where i found out that you had uh, actually met mary yeah. so uh, w would you like to talk about that experience and uh, sure. let people know uh, so yeah i'll just highlight you and yeah so uh back in the early 2000s i was an americorps volunteer um in the portland public school system in oregon and uh, part of my role, I was a field naturalist. So um, it was an environmental science special focus school. So we got to take students out and do, you know, stream monitoring and, you know, take them out to parks. Oh, we did everything. We did like winter twig ID. I used to know like 20 different shrubs in Oregon and you can identify them in the winter just from the buds. Um, but yeah, so we, we had a worm bin. Um, and part of my job was to be a waste reduction educator at the middle school, but also to incorporate some of that like understanding into the science curriculum. So to try and integrate, okay, well, we're doing this for waste management and to teach students about sustainability, but how can we also like cross link it to the science curriculum as well? So we did a couple of fun things um, in the science lab, but I was new to worm vermicomposting. My mom had gotten me a worm bin and some worms. So I was kind of tinkering around at home, um, but I didn't know a ton. So I was um, really happy when AmeriCorps, they, they do professional development for the volunteers. So I applied and I said, look, there's this cool conference in Portland. It's called Earthworms and Ecotechnology. This was in 2000 uh, and I wanna go, right? I wanna learn more about this uh, to help me be a better waste reduction educator. So they sent me to the conference. Um, Mary Applehoff was there. I believe Clive Edwards was there. All of these kind of uh, famous vermicomposters. Again, it's a small field, but like <laughs> uh, so many people have contributed so much to it. And um, yeah, I, I'm very sorry to say I lost my signed copy of Worms Eat My Garbage. So I met Mary, she signed the book. I bought the book at the conference. Um, I believe also at the middle school, we had, she has a companion book to this one um, called Worms Eat Our Garbage. Um, and it has more classroom tie-ins um, and a little bit more of like institutional waste management, you know, instead of just doing it at home, thinking about like, well, how could you do it at a school or a church or a community center? Um, so yeah, I uh, got to see her talk and, and really, I mean, that uh, kicked off like a, like a 15 year obsession on, on my end. Um, it was very inspirational to, to meet some of those early creators of, um, of the field really. Uh, and Mary, you know, so many people loved her. Uh, she, she inspired so many other people and I, I'm very sorry that I didn't get into it like a little bit earlier. Cause I would have loved to be able to say I was at the Vermillennium conference. So in the year 2000, I mean, she'd been doing waste management education for at least a decade before that, um, if not more. And she had an international conference that she hosted in Kalamazoo, Michigan, focused on vermicomposting, and they called it the Vermillennium. Um, and I know people who were there. I heard it was amazing, uh, but I was not there. I can only I can only dream about what that would have been like. So. You're that, muted. Yeah, I, I just unmuted myself. That's awesome. Has has the field expanded? Because I know that in in this book, she talks. She's kind of inspiring and trying to create more more ladies like yourself out there. And as, is 
it had, has she been successful with that? You said that there's a lot of people out there that adore her and I'm one of them. I didn't, yeah. you know, I'm not teaching anybody, but I, you know, I, I really enjoyed the book and learned a lot from it. It's helped my life out a lot. That's for sure. Well, I would say, I mean, one of my mentors in this field who was like, uh, who, who considered Mary a mentor, uh, would be Rhonda Sherman. She runs a vermicomposting education program at North Carolina State University. And I really encourage everyone. She has an annual conference. I'm not sure of the status with those with the pandemic, if they're still in person. Um, I think I spoke at maybe three or four of them. Fantastic conferences. Um, she hosts there. She brings people in from all over the world to talk about different kinds of projects, um, you know, from a waste management angle, but also then from a, OK, well, how do you use the finished material and what are best practices for using the vermicompost um, in different horticulture and agricultural settings? So really encourage everyone to check her out. She has a new book out. Um, she actually just did. Oh, my gosh, I, I, I'll have to find the link now and put it in the chat. But um she she got interviewed uh, by like some sort of cool sci-fi magazine that was like, OK, tell us how earthworms are the same as the worms in Dune. <laughs> so she's like, only in my life do I get to get interviewed because <laughs> she's a big Dune fan. So she got to say, OK, well, here are the similarities and here are the differences between the sandworms and the earthworm. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I encourage everyone to check out her website, her book. Um, she's done a lot of media appearances and then really that annual conference has been a cornerstone of, of kind of this loosely connected international community really focused on vermicomposting. And I would say, I mean, when I first got interested in it, if you asked anyone like about worm composting, they would always say, oh, worm bin, you know, a small little bin and you could buy a bin and you could use it at home. But I think in, in the intervening decades, um, it's, it's gained more acceptance in the larger waste management community and the larger composting community, like the U.S. Composting Council, vermicomposting always used to be like the strange cousin of like, oh, well, isn't that just like, you know, bins that you do in school for education for kids? It's like, no, it also actually works really well large scale. So I would say there's been a lot of um, uh, a lot of growth and, you know, infrastructure development and, you know, different kind of engineering um, uh, uh, like breakthroughs and, and design uh, the design updates to, to help vermicomposting really work large scale. Um, and yeah, it's something fun that you can do yourself. It's an avenue for people to get interested about decomposition and soil microbes and all of that. But it also is a viable large scale waste management strategy um, that's that's profitable too. So um, I think that's, that's part of Mary's expanded legacy is all the people that she's inspired and kind of the industry that, that's come up around that. That, that's good to hear. When I was uh, researching this, as I was I wanted to, since you were uh, kind of well connected in this vermi, vermicomposting community, I, there's some other people that I wanted to uh, pick your brain about too. The uh, worm power guy. Oh there. yeah. Yeah, his he I, his name's escaping me right now. And there's another guy like we were just talking about, uh, large scale. Is he does uh, does this for his municipal municipality, and uh, he does it in big wind windrows with worms and chickens, and that's just that they do all of the turning, and he has like a month turnaround when they bring the fresh stuff in, and it's like over like overflow from the uh, the uh, like vegetable processing industry. Mm -hmm. He's like it, it really tight. He's, I think he's in California. I don't remember, but I couldn't find this guy's name. Uh, uh, so anyway, I'm. Yeah. So I mean, the the worm power guy. I yeah. Uh, I got to collaborate with him for years. So uh, awesome. it's Tom Harley, and I'm very excited to say. So he came on last year and gave some updates on large scale projects he was working on um, in different parts of the country and in Mexico. So. Um, you know, he'll, he'll text me videos every once in a while of like some amazing gigantic facility. <laughs> I, I really want to tour the one in Mexico, but it's been hard with the travel restrictions, but, um, uh, very excited to see connections, right? Cause like what you're talking about, 
you know, that's, that's really what he taught me is like, don't just see it as the waste management and don't just see it as a way to produce a cool compost. You have to tie both of those things together. And then you have to find a region where there's a lot of waste being created that could be managed that way. But then there are also a lot of, um, you know, vegetable production or cannabis production or any other kind of specialty crop production in that area that would be a good home for the finished product. So it's, it's really multidisciplinary, right? Because usually like waste management is from an engineering mindset and like a process design mindset, thinking about how to best manage the waste. But when you look on the use side and you get all the plant scientists involved, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's like we're looking for this in a quality compost and that in a quality compost. And you really have to match those things up so that, yes, you have a good, efficient process um, that gets you to where you want to be. But then the finished product is actually like a high quality, consistent product that that growers can use and that they can depend on to be relatively consistent o- over batches. Um, so I think the what he said last year and um, just talking with him in the intervening time, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of greenhouse tomato in the area in Mexico where he's worked on this facility. So it's cattle manure. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's from a feedlot or a dairy that he's working with. And then, you know, they, they have the finished product. It's OMRI listed. It's ready to go for certified organic vegetables or anything else. Um, and then they can sell it right into those surrounding uh, greenhouse production places. So yeah, he, he helped me think of it at, at a regional level of, okay, well, you need the waste, but then you need, <laughs> you need somewhere that you would then sell the finished product to, and you better make sure that finished product fits the production system that, that you're trying to, um, to, to service basically, like to make an input for. That's awesome, especially if he is doing it from a feedlot. Like if he's turning that horrible substance into something beautiful and useful, then he's he's the magician that I think he is, man. Because it, I can't remember the documentary where I learned about him, but he's he's a very special dude indeed. He's like, he's worked fish into it and everything. He's yeah. What did you say his name? It, it's slipping. Well, so okay, there. Uh, so Tom Harley, he's the one from Worm Power. So he started Worm Power in Western New York in the Rochester area, and now he's actually independent uh, and working for like an engineering consulting firm. And his most recent project was in Mexico, and he came on uh, the Future Cannabis Project about a year ago uh, on that day of worms. And I mean, you can see he's got slides, he's got updates of all the facilities and and all the stuff that they're doing, and. He's really been the one that's kind of shown that it works as a viable large scale manure management uh, process, right? Because that it was hard to get people that were used to doing hot compost only to even consider that it was anything other than something cute that you do in a small scale. Um, and also at that, uh, so at the Earthworms and Eco Technology Conference in 2000 in Portland, Oregon, Clive Edwards was there. And that was the first time I met Clive. Um, I got to meet him a bunch of other times. You know, he was always at, uh, at Rhonda's uh, annual vermicomposting conference. Um, he actually passed this year. I'm, I'm sorry to say I, um, I saw that on LinkedIn. Um, but he was active all the way. Like he, he never retired, right? He was always active and, and always like sharing his love of this technology. So something that he kind of pioneered that then Tom built off of was the idea of um, what they call the continuous flow reactor. And that was one of the engineering developments that that helped this technology uh, be more efficient large scale. So um, thinking about continuous flow where you're always feeding in a small layer on top, and then you have a bar that goes along the bottom and you're always scraping it off the bottom um, and the worms just migrate upwards, right? So your worms are migrating toward the food source, your material overall is moving through, but you're feeding and harvesting, feeding and harvesting, and then the worms kind of migrate and stay in the box, right? If you harvest too early, you lose your worms. <laughs> um, but that that was a design um, innovation that that he really pioneered and that a lot of other engineers like Tom Harley he have have taken and built off of and like improved and and shown that they can really work uh, at a large scale facility when we're talking like football football field size. <laughs> wow. 
that's that's amazing. I was, I'm wondering what that screening material is made out of to where because I know that that worms that worm stuff it, it'll eat anything up. Is you that's why they tell you to make those worm bins out of plastic because that's about the only thing that worm poop won't decompose. <laughs> it's amazing, beautiful stuff. Yeah. So that that um, thank you for that book recommendation that that just flashed across the screen. That's a great one. So vermicul uh, vermiculture technology. I think I had a chapter in one edition of those about the disease suppression angle. Um, but Clive and Rhonda were were collaborators for for decades, um, and they they have highlights of different large scale facilities because that was really something that you know. It, I think vermicomposting was accepted first in kind of the school environment and small farms, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But then they really helped to bring it mainstream into larger waste management circles and into those conversations. So that book has some great profiles of different large scale facilities um, around the world and, and how people work with different manure uh, streams. I think for that, for the screening piece, I believe it was like wire, uh, it was metal. Um, but then I don't know how you deal with rust. Yeah, this, <laughs> that's that a piece. good question. See, I wish Tom was on. I would just ask him. I'm gonna like text him. <laughs> yeah, this is stainless steel or aluminum, I guess. But aluminum's so brittle, and I can see uh, worm poop chewing up aluminum too, because again, it's so brittle. So anyway, I I deal with metal a lot, so I think in those those terms, so I've. Anyway. Uh, oh, uh, great the, question without the first hot composting. So the, the system that I'm describing with the continuous flow through, that's a great point. There is a hot step first um, because you're right. If you just threw raw manure into the worms, it heats up a little too much for them and it can go like anaerobic and not be a great environment. So um, the, the continuous flow system, most of them that I'm aware of and that I've toured and, and worked with, um, they hot compost first, but only the first step, right? Because a traditional thermophilic composting would be a hot compost and then a long kind of curing stage. So you would think of this as the hot stage happens. Um, I know at the, the worm power facility in Avon, New York, they had um, uh, blowers. So they had like a static aerated pile with blowers underneath and they would test the temperature. So they do all their pathogen reduction and all of that at that stage. And once it got to a certain point where you would have taken it out and windrowed it for, for curing for that like longer tail of, of the decomposition, then they took that and fed to the bins. And again, we're talking thin layers because I think even if you had taken that feedstock and dumped it all in the bin like that that would kind of turn the system sideways so it is a very carefully managed system where it's like okay i'm literally adding an inch of that every day but if you overdo it you know you you can you can cause things to go off balance um and something that i've learned about more in my career in microbes um there's a concept called solid state fermentation where you're producing a microbe or an enzyme made by a microbe in a solid state. Because you think of fermentation like wine or beer, like it happens in a jug and in water, but you can you can basically do fermentation in, in solid materials as well. And that's kind of what it is. It's like worm assisted solid state fermentation um, in that continuous flow reactor system. Yeah, but that's a great point. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. No, you can't. <laughs> yeah, manure is a little bit touchy. A, lo a lot of it requires um, some pre-processing, whereas like food scraps wouldn't necessarily uh, need to do that hot step first. But I'm not as familiar with the food waste composting for the large scale ones. The worms seem to appreciate things being broken down for them first anyway, is that, like you said, that first composting step and then you mm -hmm. run it through that reactor is I do sort of the same thing here is I, I, all of our food waste goes out to the chickens and then the chickens process that and I just scoop out their, their run and coop and everything and uh, dump that in the big worm bin outside and that's it, it, it keeps things going and it's, you're not putting anything too hot in there. And that's a question that I have for you is uh, how big of a miracle can the worms uh, achieve? Like what, what's the like most horrible thing that uh, that feedlot stuff, if that, if that's what he was using, that's a, that's an amazing feed in itself, but are there some other, like, uh, can they do toxic waste and stuff like that? <laughs> 
Well, uh, so there, I mean, if you look into the research, there has been some research that, that earthworms can, you know, do bioremediation. Um, but just like with all bioremediation, you then have the problem that if the earthworms concentrate and accumulate that in their own biomass, you, you basically have to take them out of the system and like dispose of them, right? Just like plant-based um, bioremediation. Oh, you know, you have a plant that can help, um, you know, take up high quantities of, of uh, you know, dangerous heavy metals or something out of the soil. Well, you now you have to take them out of the system before they decompose back into the system because they would just release it back in. So there has been definitely, um, there's a great journal and uh, you can probably find some of them online. It's called Bioresource Technology. So it's kind of a, a hybrid scientific, but also like applied engineering journal um, that has so much cool stuff from all over the world of like different kinds of systems like that. And they cover um, some of the bioremediation angle too. Now, are there, uh, so she talks a lot about the different species of worms in here. And are there some that are better at like those hardcore jobs that, that might like take a tougher worm than our little red wigglers. They're pretty tough. They can deal with some stuff, but you know, is there, are there like specific varieties that work best in certain situations? I think out of everything I've read, um, the Icinia fetida, the, the red wiggler is probably the most common. There's also Dendrobana veneta, which, um, oh man, so you're going to, uh, I think has like a, a different temperature range. Um, and that one I've, I've read a lot about more in the tropics, um, like in the Philippines and in India. Um, so I know from, from, you know, learning how Tom designed his facility, uh, like he had a mixture of three different species together thinking about like, okay, well, if this one does well in this environmental range and this one does well in this environmental range and this one does well in this environmental range. And as much as you're controlling the temperature and climate and everything, I mean, he was in Western New York, so you've got super hot summers, super cold winters. So it was like a hedge your bets strategy, right? Okay, if I have three different species that, I mean, they did all right together, they didn't outcompete each other, but at certain times of the year, he'd maybe have a higher, higher population level of one rather than the other two. And then they would kind of go through cycles like that. Um, so I think that's an interesting way to, yeah, to, to manage um, climactic change and, and environmental change, which any system really has, it's almost impossible to level that out to nothing. So um, thinking of, okay, well, if I know the range that they're going to experience is this, maybe I could get a worm that does well here and a worm that does well here, get them in there together and, and see what happens. That's cool. Uh, what's what's the the cutting edge right now? Is what are what are you all excited about in the vermifile world? Well, so and I'm sad to say I've been out of the vermifile world for a while. So I'm I'm now like I, I'm a fan looking back into the world. Um, so <laughs> I haven't been directly working like with the compost industry probably for about ten years. Um, so I'm a little bit out of touch. I, I can say that, like, I know there's cool stuff going on. Um, I, I know there's like a lot of cool, huge facilities around. Um, uh, I've been most recently in touch also, you know, there, there's some cool facilities in Europe, um, poor or poor ver, like P U R and then V E R is uh, a facility in Belgium that's, that's serving specialty crop markets. Um, so it's just exciting to see like companies come out of all of this development over the years and be able to enter this space and, and be successful. So, but I am definitely on the outside kind of looking in as, as a worm fan at this point. Um, I hope at some point in my career, I get to, to work directly with compost again. Right now I'm like all microbes all the time, but, uh, I, I'm only doing composting at home, so. Okay. Well, tell us about what you're doing. What are you excited about with your, your microbes that you're looking at now? What are you bringing to the world? What kind of knowledge are you going to spread? Well, um, so, I mean, it's, it's, I would call it a parallel industry, right? Um, so that, that cultural shift that we're seeing in agriculture right now from, um, from chemi chemical inputs, um, from genetically modified inputs and traits, 
um, to then seeing, well, what about microbes? Like what, what about soil health? What about regenerative agriculture? What about organic agriculture? So um, I really do see the composting world and the biologicals, the egg biologicals and horticultural biologicals industry as, as kind of on, on parallel paths, right? Um, this increasing acceptance of um, biological, like naturally occurring microbes, um, you know, microbes that have benefits to plants that can help with plant health, that can help with uh, increased yield, that can help with soil health. So yeah, it's, um, I do see it as parallel. You're at the end of the day, you've still got microbes and plants together. Um, it's just that in, in my world currently, um, we're looking at, you know, single species or maybe two or three microbes together, again, grown up in a giant vat and like unleashed upon, upon the world. <laughs> so, um, but, but some of those same effects. So, um, my project that I did with worm power uh, during my dissertation, that's now a while ago, <laughs> uh, but uh, we were looking at pythium suppression. So how did the microbes in that specific vermicomposted material, how did they suppress pythium um, in cucumber seeds, kind of just as a model system? And kind of the through line in my career I've done now, you know, because I'm a, a pythium specialist or that was most of my training, um, I've been able to take different microbes that I've worked with at different plant microbiome startups and say, okay, well, which one of these microbes can actually help with some of these plant diseases that um, are really tricky to deal with? So yeah, um, uh, it's, it's really cool to see the acceptance of biologicals, like same thing with worm composting, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you bring up worm composting and people are like, well, that's cute, but it's just a little bin that like someone does at school for education. It's not really a viable waste management strategy. Same thing with biologicals. Oh, that's just this niche industry. It's only for like organic specialty crops. I mean, I'm, I'm working with um, mainstream row crop growers who are like, oh yeah, I'm totally into biologicals. And I, I want to see what what these biological tools can do in, in my production toolbox and how we can increase soil health and increase plant health um, and do it in a natural and, and sustainable way. So um, yeah, it's it's parallel paths, but I do hope at some point to, to bring some compost back into the microbials or figure out how to uh, include that. So yeah, baby steps. Uh, farmers, they're, they're a fickle bunch and they don't like changing things. And so it, it you take the wins that you get. It, it's amazing the questions that I, I get from some of these. I, I'm a little bitty guy, but I, I know some big time farmers and they know that I do things differently than they do. And they eat my food and they they get it, you know. So they, they ask me some questions sometimes. Uh, it's like, oh, OK, I, I'm getting through a little bit here. So it, it, it is interesting. So, yeah, I, I could see why they would rather like I, I imagine that this is like some uh, what you're working on is something that can be. Uh, hooked to it, uh, put in a tank and sprayed across the field. Mm -hmm. And that that's, that's what they dig. They're not going to want to go spreading compost all over the place. And as I actually got my neighbor to do that though, as he went out and found this old piece of equipment as uh, I can't remember the actual name of it, but we call it the shit spreader. And it just like, it pushes. <laughs> I think they're called spreaders, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. It just pushes it towards the back with this yeah. boom. And it's got these little things that just fling that stuff all over the field for you. And, yeah, he's and uh, he's not having to like uh, leave fallow ground. Like he doesn't have to leave the field fallow and like miss out on that hay that year. So it's yeah, it, it was, like I said, baby steps. You can't you you can't like push a farmer along. They're gonna they're gonna do things when they want to do it, and you got to respect that with with everybody, farmers, individuals, period. Doesn't matter what yeah, and that whole thing of like fitting into an existing production system. I mean, that's uh, it's it's true, right? You can't be like, oh, I have this technology. It's so amazing. But you have to do this extra thing or like do an extra pass on the field or do different equipment like it, it has to somehow fit within the existing production system to, to, to start, right? I mean, maybe if it really is the best product since, you know, sliced bread, like someone would get a new piece of equipment for it. But um, for, for meeting people where they are, it's like, okay, well, tell me about your production system and then where do we best fit in, right? Um, and grower convenience is so key. Uh, I've, I've learned that over and over and over again in my career. It's like, oh, okay, oh, maybe we have to change the way that's applied to make it more convenient. 
Yeah. Yeah. The convenience is my thing. Is that's how I got into this book? Is that I bought this from the hydro store. I started off as a hydro farmer, and uh, just out of necessity, a lot of you know, a, a lot of people start off in an apartment, and uh, you get in you, you like uh, raise suspicions when you're carrying bags of soil up the steps to your apartment. And it's what are you doing there, kid? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so I, if you're uh, if you're known to have fish tanks and stuff and you're carrying hydrogen rocks, they don't think a thing of it. So anyway, so I started off with that and uh, it was just I was always spending money and like going to buy this or go get this piece of equipment or something. like. I was like, that. I grew up around farms and I know that there's a better way for me to do this and I can still keep my head down. So I got into this, uh, this worm thing. I started making my own soil with the worm bin in the in the kitchen. So, yeah, it, it started me on my organic journey and it has saved me a lot of work and money. And it's it's made my life much more beautiful. So it, on this Thanksgiving, I thank Mary Applehoff for starting me on this path. It's uh, she changed my life with this book. So that's uh, I'm very happy to be talking to you about it today. Well, and likewise, and I think if I hadn't met her and been at that conference at that particular time in my career development, who knows, you know, maybe I wouldn't be in biologicals now, or maybe I wouldn't even be in ag because it was so inspiring to think like you're solving a problem here, but then you're also solving a problem here, right? Like that, that's a great thing to, to reconnect systems. Yeah, yeah, this is because it, that's really all this is, is everything's connected. And it's, it's amazing that uh, they're, they're bringing this in, into uh, the mainstream. If people, you keep talking about how this is being accepted now as they're doing it in Windrose. I wish that I could, I could have found the guy that I keep, uh, maybe if I described him to you. Yeah. He's, uh, he's an older, older gentleman. He wears one of those, like, uh, I don't know what they're called, but they're like a cap like this, but they like fold down in the front and snap. And he's got these like really thick, like handlebar mustache. Hmm. And he runs this huge windrow facility out there and he's like uh, taking garbage from these uh, uh, big vegetable vegetable producers and then giving them compost back or selling them compost back to for them Where to make located? more trash for him. I, I'm pretty sure he's in California because he has so much access to the uh, vegetable producing industry. As I, I, I searched and searched for him, but I couldn't find him or the documentary that I'd Think, things uh, disappear on the internet, as we all know. But uh, exactly, he, he's well, a really so, interesting I mean, dude. Chambers, um, uh, I know he's kind of. I a year ago when Peter contacted say, me, and say he, that name again. Of uh, 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 Jack Chambers. Jack Chambers. So I tried to get him on a year ago for the Day of Worms, and he's like, "Well, I've kind of retired. Like my company's still around, so that's when I know of the Sonoma Valley Worm Farm." Um, but he's not actively, he's like, well, I'm kind of like not really actively involved in day-to-day -day operations, but thanks for the invite. But that's another like really great one. I don't know if he was in that documentary um, and he does not have a handlebar mustache. So I'm probably yeah, striking yeah. out on, on the guy that you're thinking of. But yeah, There was a period of time there. I was watching several of them. It was, it was either fresh or the one with, uh, I get him, get him so confused. Uh, the, the beautiful lady over in India, the seed saver, uh, Shiva. Yeah. I'm thinking that he was on the same documentary that, that she was on. But anyway, he, he does the what you were talking about. Is it really doesn't matter about this specific individual because you know somebody doing the same thing, but without yeah. the chickens. He's doing it with the chickens. And he said that the chickens are what gets, gets him the quick turnaround, is that they're basically doing all of the turning, looking for his worms, and they can't kill them all. So... That's, I've seen you know, some really cool, um, I haven't seen them in person, but I've read about them when I was doing a lot of reading um, during graduate school. Like there are cool systems in Australia where they have rabbits and then they have worms and they're stacked, right? So you've got the rabbits and the rabbits are eating delicious fresh stuff and hay and everything else. And then they're pooping out their pellets and the pellets just fall straight into a worm bin. The worms work through those. And again, it's it's a it's a more gentle kind of manure um, as, as to the to viewer's question before of like, ah, you know, hot manure will get too hot. Um, the 
for whatever reason, the gut of the of the rabbit is is pretty. It, it's it's not very hot manure, right? Like it, you would need a lot of it to kind of heat up or to to get really like high levels of urea or anything else. So um, yeah, so you can actually just take the rabbit manure straight into the worm bin. And then they just had the vertical stack and then, you know, the worm castings come out of that. So I thought that was a just a brilliant design. And um, I had some good success. I, I think they're still commercially available. And so I'm like frantically Googling things while I'm in here. Uh, when, when I was at the middle school, um, I used what was called a worm wigwam, which is a great name. Uh, so that came out of um, uh, Peter Bogdanov's uh Kind of he had he had a catalog of different vermicomposting equipment like in the late 90s and early 2000s i know he's in real estate now we keep in touch i i love all my worm people <laughs> um oh they hate rabbit urine okay that no flash that again okay well that that's a really important point thank you yeah so apparently they don't like the rabbit urine as much but the, but the manure is pretty safe to add in um uh directly so yeah, I, the worm wigwam is like a, the smallest continuous flow system that you can buy. So it's about like three feet by three feet and it's circular. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I, I ran one of those at the middle school with the students with our um, just like cafeteria waste. But I liked them so much, um, I ended up buying one for my house and I composted, I think, four of my neighbor's food scraps. So I was just getting buckets and buckets of food scraps and I did have a rabbit and I made sure to have the paper bedding, um, that recycled paper bedding instead of the cedar. Um, and then I just put all of that into the into the system, too. And it, it turned out like that was really nice stuff. Um, and then I sold worms to our local master composter program. Um, I think also um, I yeah, want to give a shout out to master composter programs around the country through Cooperative Extension, because I think they've done just great community education around this. And they, they use resources like Worms Eat My Garbage and Worms Eat Our Garbage and, and other books that have been published since then um, to, to help get people set up and feel confident doing it on their own. And, uh, you know, community gardens, that kind of stuff, too. So Tompkins County in, in upstate New York was actually the first, I believe it was the first master composter. I could be wrong because there's master recycler and then there's also, you know, master food preserver, master gardener, all those types of programs. Um, but yeah, the Tompkins County Cooperative Extension Master Composter Program has really um, helped kick off a lot of other similar programs in, in other states. Okay, flash that one again about rabbit poop. Oh yeah, yeah. They're um, what's it called? Like a cecotroph. They have that special night poop that they make in a certain part of their anatomy, and then they they eat it to kind of re-inoculate their their system. They're very strange. They're logomorphs. Like they're not ruminants, right? It's different. It's different than cow manure. Hmm. That's interesting. I've, I've never even heard that word before. What's a what's a logomorph? What, what are well, they're like, they're not rodents. So I think the logomorph is um, kind of the, the type of animal that they are. And then the cecotroph is animals that, because, um, you know, like cows with the ruminant stomach, they'll regurgitate and chew and then like it goes to a different stomach and all of that. Um, with logomorphs and cecotrophs, like I think um, guinea pigs are also cecotrophs. They have a special fermentation area in their gut um, that almost like keeps the microbes that they need to re-inoculate their system, almost, I guess, like our appendix, um, but we don't like eat the contents of our appendix every night, but yeah. <laughs> huh, that's interesting. What, what else is in the family with rabbits? Like what else... Yeah, you're you're asking like a plant scientist about animals. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. That right yeah. <laughs> that, gotcha, that, the, gotcha. the chat can jump in on that one. I hear you. That's, yeah. I'm sorry. You, you, I, that, you used that big word and you had rabbits. So I thought that I, I learned something real quick. That's that's cool. <laughs> so uh, with the uh, something speak, speaking of uh, animal anatomy, let's take it back to the worms. As why do the tropical worms like have completely different, uh, I guess you'd 
would say, I can't remember the actual term, but legs. Like the, instead of having the, uh, the circles around their uh, linear, they have like uh, lines going down their body instead of the, the circular like bristles. I, I, I should know, I just went through this book. I can't remember that term right now, but I'm, I'm blanking out. But uh, what, why are the tropical worms a little bit like, why are they structured differently? Is it just the sand or? Well, that's a great question. Are they, so they're, they're annelids, but they don't have like the circular segments. They must be a totally different type of, of invertebrate than like maybe not an earthworm. Well, no, they have the uh, they have the segments. I'm not talking about the muscles. I'm talking about the oh. little bristles. The little bristles. The way that it's structured on them, it's in it's uh, on lines going down the body instead of circular and like rings going down the body, like the segments are in the muscles and everything. And I was wondering, is like why such a drastic difference in that? Uh, there's there's all kinds of worms all over the world, obviously, but it seems like there's just like those two different like structure types. And I was uh, wondering what what could be <laughs> asking another. Me. I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I mean, I've I've worked mostly with the the red wigglers and then the dendrobana veneta, um, and they they all have like that you know the the circular uh, sections all the way down. So I'm not sure. I'm not coming up with a picture in my head of of uh, of that different kind of morphology. Um, so I'd have to look into that and get back to you. But um, I think what there there are different ecological types of worms too, and that's something when I was first learning about it and first reading about it. Um, you know, there are different types of earthworms. Uh, the ones that are best suited for vermicomposting are um, are not the same that live in the mineral soil, right? So if you think about um, like night crawlers and all the lumbricus kind of species, um, I think those are called anisic. Again, this is like in the way back machine of my brain, so we're like pulling it forward here. <laughs> um, so. There, there are worms that like to live in the mineral layer of soil. They live alone. They make burrows, like they hang out by themselves. They go up to the surface and kind of feed and, and pull leaf matter in. Um, those are, that's a totally different ecological type of worm that like is not really suited for, for vermicomposting. So um, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it's epigeic is the term for the worms that live in the organic layer of soil. Um, like the top layer, and they're the ones that are working down the leaf litter and working down like manure and, you know, even working through dead animals and all of that. Um, they live like in higher densities, so they don't mind like living closely with each other and they don't really have permanent burrows. They just kind of go around in that organic layer. So um, in different parts of the world where people are looking at kind of local worm populations and trying to figure out which ones might be suitable, um, it's great to get those ones that already live in, the, in that top layer. Uh, yeah, that yeah you sense. stumped me on the, on the, <laughs> the vertical lines. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, if she doesn't explain it well in that book. Uh, that could be one of the things that she, she's really pushing people to study this field in this book. And it's, uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions out there. That could be one of them that may, have, may be answered. Who knows? But uh, uh, as you were saying earlier, we're losing a lot of these people. He said that uh, one of the other yeah. pioneers, we just lost him. So that's, uh, yeah, we need to be regenerating. They need to be ma making more vermophiles to understand what's going on beneath our feet. No, that's true. And I mean, it. it is in the past 10 years, you know, with Mary Applehoff passing and Clive Edwards passing and a couple people retiring too, right? Um, that it, it is kind of a generational shift because there was this core group of people who were, you know, at all the conferences and like working on advancing the field in different areas and, you know, friendly with each other and collaborative with each other. So yeah, it's um, it's definitely it's good to keep an eye on that next generation, and and I can track. I mean, like Clive Edwards was the mentor of Norm Aaron and he's at um, University of Hawaii, I think Manoa, um, and he's still working with vermicomposting, right? He did his postdoc with Clive, so you can you can kind of track those uh, those academic lineages, right? Of like this person mentored this person, and then now they're doing this, and then they're mentoring others. Um, but it is always hard when you see kind of a whole generation of pioneers um, 
turning over within, <laughs> you know, or leaving, leaving the field. Um, so, but again, they all leave like enormous legacies and, and a lot of material to build off of and, and for the next group of folks to kind of dig their teeth into and, and see what they can um, contribute. Yeah. As we're going through the same thing in the cannabis world too. A lot of the pioneers are dying off on us and this is just the nature of things. So let's, let's bring it to a, to a lighter note. Uh, uh, you said that you lost this book, but uh, as, when you were going I through another one. <laughs> okay, cool, no, no, cool, no, cool. No, I don't have the signed copy from Mary. I'm, I'm just like so sad about that. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, you said that you picked it up when you had uh, first started getting into this and then you ended up going to school for, and studying the, that subject and everything. So what what did you uh, pick up from this book that like kind of was like a revelation when you were sitting in some uh, lecture room somewhere and you're like, I learned that like years ago when I was a kid looking at that book from Mary. Is that, yeah. Can you tell me about one of those? You had to have had a couple of them. Well, I mean, so the crazy thing about grad school, it's not like there was like a composting class, right? So uh, I I did my master's in soil science and soil microbiology, and then I did my PhD, PhD in um, plant pathology, uh, and both with a focus on plant microbe interactions. So over my entire time in graduate school, um, other than my interactions with the Cornell Waste Management Institute um, and doing some collaborative work with them, I can say like compost was maybe, maybe mentioned like once in an intro soils class, maybe, right? And maybe a little bit in a soil ecology class, but there, there wasn't other than like the, from the ag engineering perspective, um, there was like a, like a composting class or an ag engineering class that included like a full unit on composting. It, it really didn't exist in the curriculum. So a lot of what I was learning, I was learning at the conferences. So like at Rhonda's conference or, um, or at the U.S. Composting Council, they would always have like a sidetrack for um, compost teas and for vermicompost. So, I mean, it, yeah, like I, my, my focus on compost it, it, um, it enhanced my research, but it, it was kind of like a separate track where I was learning from all these people out doing it in the world and then bringing that back into my research. So yeah, uh, she, this book really, really started me on that path. Um, and yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's beautiful to hear. Is there, uh, what are some, uh, she, she talks a lot about the, the uh, again, losing a term in my mind now that I'm here talking to you, but the, the juice, the juice yeah. that comes out of the bottom. It's like uh, I've found several different things that uh, I've used it straight. I've mm -hmm. diluted it. It's like it just seems like there's you can do no wrong with that stuff. Is, is there like a, a way that you can misuse that or is it just golden no matter what? Well, I mean, so that, that's kind of, that's something that I think the, the field has developed like a little more since then. So, I mean, I know now, even for master composter programs, we, we were always taught to say, you know, if you have that much liquid running out of the bottom of your system, you're running it too wet. You basically need to add more dry bedding. Um, so like, yes, it's great stuff. Um, it can be maybe a little too hot or a little too concentrated. And if you really are running the system very wet, it could be like, have gone anaerobic, right? Um, and then have kind of a different microbial community that is the lower oxygen levels, which may not necessarily be something that you'd want to put straight on plants. So I know kind of in the very beginning, there was like, oh, it's like worm liquor, or like worm tea or the stuff that comes out the bottom. Um, I think that has kind of shifted in, in at least the master composter programs and some of the stuff that, you know, in the research and, and, and the, the development of the field is like, mm, you shouldn't be having that much liquid coming out of the system. Um, but on the flip side, if you take finished castings and mix them with water, 
and either do an aerated compost tea or a non-aerated liquid compost extract, I got to do some really fun projects um, with Tom Harley. He with that, we collaborated on some cool stuff there. And you can like you can make some interesting products that are that are like pretty shelf stable and um, that provide plant nutrients and provide beneficial microbes. So it's, I think the field has really shifted to, okay, manage your system a little drier, like avoid the run through, but absolutely thinking about, and again, back to that point of grower convenience, like you said, it's so hard, like, how are you going to add solids, right? And how are you going to add solids in a greenhouse once everything's all potted up, right? You can't add them like three weeks in and you can't like sprinkle them on top. It's, it's hard to do. So I think the, the idea of a liquid extract that contains the microbes from the castings is like really easy to apply, right? Like really convenient to use. Um, and you don't get the physical benefit within the potting media, but you get the microbial benefit and the, the nutrient benefit too. Okay. As I probably was running mine a little too wet, it's, especially in the middle of the summer, you got rotten tomatoes and cantaloupes yeah. and all of that. And it says, I don't even run my system like that anymore. All of that goes to the chicken. So it doesn't even, it doesn't matter anymore. Oh, no, it's back so when I was like, it, it, you can get condensation on the inside, depending on what kind of unit it is. And then that drips down and then that makes it wetter. Like, yeah, the, the moisture management is, is all, I, I, I haven't seen any perfect system for moisture management for sure. Yeah, a, the, the system that I have outside is a perfect system for me. It's just a pile of rocks that has a bunch of chicken manure and nice. every once in a while I throw some cow manure in it, but it's just the uh, yard scraps. But they they uh, keep going throughout the winter. It, it gets pretty cold here and it's above ground, obviously, the pile of rocks. But it, it, it they it, I watched the pile go down with snow on it. Like we have a it's a, a, I really respect the worm. And it's it's amazing what they do. It's, uh, they're incredible, and I they they make very tasty food and cannabis and it, just anything. As the the herbs, you can taste the difference in your herbs that you're cooking with. It's when you're using the vermicompost and all of that. Is that I've I've grown a bunch of different ways, and I have a pretty good uh, nose and sense of taste and everything. So I'm kind of picky in that way, and I. I the worms really do make a difference. So, so in, in your system, how do you manage the worm population when you're harvesting? Because I've seen in some Winrow systems, they always feed on one side so that you can kind of safely harvest the other side without taking too many of your worms out. Like how, how do you manage that in your system and, and keep your worm population, you know, consistent and, and healthy? That, that mainly the rocks. Like I can't ever take it all out. So right. when I'm in there digging, they like, Die, they dive for the center and try to get away from me and the light and everything. So it just, it's, I dig away everything except for what I can't move in those rocks. And then they just come back from there because I'll, well, I don't empty it until I have enough stuff to pile in there to start over again. Like if it's time to clean out the chickens, uh, something like that. Or if I, my neighbor has, has some good, good manure over there that's been sitting around a while, I'll go over there and get some of that. But, uh, it's just that, uh, I, I've have uh, I harvested uh, at the beginning of this season, and they've they've been rocking all all summer long. They came awesome. back almost immediately. So, and uh, I, I'm planning on uh, making another garden the size of the one that I made this year, and I'm gonna empty the system again next year and see uh, because the what I emptied this this year was uh, two maybe three years cooking. Mm -hmm. So it was really broken down as, and I'm going to see the difference between that material that I emptied out last, last spring and what I'm going to do this next spring with just one year and me spreading things around more. Cause I also like when I'm digging a hole and I get a nice big chunk of clay, I'll throw that in there to them because mm -hmm. I've noticed that the worms love that red clay. They, they get deep in there. I, well, I dug a pond and you could see like uh, about six feet down like right before the, the white clay started, you had worms, night crawlers, all the way deep down and burrowing through that tight, hard red clay. It was just wow. amazing to see. It's, a, 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 it's an, a, the worm is an incredible creature. Like the, they're different than just about anything out there. 
they're like their their own own thing because there's only like a couple like structure types like i was talking about earlier and there's little known about that and it's just the 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 most important things in life it seems are uh, often overlooked like they they do a lot for us we we wouldn't be uh, able to eat much without topsoil because even if you're a meat eater those cows and pigs and they need that topsoil to grow that nice uh yeah. grasses and whatever else that they're they're feeding on so so uh, there's a yeah. fun book that um pete bogdanov carried in his kind of vermicomposting uh catalog um and I'm, now i'm forgetting the name of his company back in the 2000s it may still be online um and those worm wigwam units are actually really cool if you're doing like medium scale right and you're doing it indoors or like in a in a in a garage or something but um he carried uh like a just a, it was a slim volume but it was darwin's kind of treatise on earth Worms, um, kind of updated for modern times with a with a nice foreword, and to think about you know Charles Darwin in the last couple decades of his life, um, especially when he was ailing, like he did all these amazing experiments with earthworms um, and and wrote about them, and it's it's a beautiful book, and and on that point of like the humblest creatures maybe do the most important things, right? Um, he did long-term experiments in his garden where he's like, huh, what if I just lay a layer of chalk, right? And then I check back on it like every 10 years <laughs> and I see how much soil has formed over it. So he was looking at like longer term soil formation so he could dig back down and then tell you how deep it was until he got to that chalk layer, right? And um, yeah, so I think it's called like on the formation of vegetable mold, like something, something, something. If, if you're a vermophile at all, like that is a must read. It's a very good book. Um, and also kind of in the classic literature, uh, Sir Albert Howard is, um, is like widely regarded as like the father of modern composting. He doesn't talk as much about worm composting, but he, the things he says about soil health, and again, he was a mentor to J.R. Rodale, who we all know started the Rodale Institute. Um, so that was kind of some cool early experimentation around composting and soil organic matter and soil health. Um, just some really interesting like things to read where you're like, huh, okay, well, if we knew this like a hundred years ago, <laughs> why, you know, why is this new information, right? But everything kind of comes around again and is, is examined in a new way with, with new tools, right? Yeah, as well. At least they're they're starting to listen to it and apply it. And you got munis municipalities doing that instead of their trash compost that they've been making for decades now. It's, it, I guess that I shouldn't call it trash compost. It, that's it's what it is. And a lot of times that's what you're getting too. Like I, I've heard a lot of war stories about people just going and getting yeah. municipal compost, and it wouldn't it, it wouldn't be an issue if they were doing it with the worms. So. Anyway, uh, that, I, I'm definitely going to have to check that out. As the, as that's going to be that's going to be a fun read, I think. As uh, uh, are there any other books besides like uh, that are kind of along the vein of hers that are, uh, but a little bit more like uh, I guess more modern. Uh, yeah. Because so this one's okay, pretty I'm going to pull up. Um... There, there's a good guide out of Canada um, that was for kind of on-farm composting. So it sounds like kind of more on the scale that you're doing it, like not just a small one for food scraps or in an apartment, but maybe like a larger system. Um, uh, and of course, now I'm going to forget the name of that one too. I should have uh, pulled up my bibliography. So I'll put this one in the chat. So again, like... Um, someone who, who knew Mary for years and, and was inspired by her and worked with her. Um, so yeah, it's the Worm Farmer's Handbook. And I believe that just came out in 2019, oh, cool. uh, 2018, 2018. So it's kind of with the most updated information. Um, it's, it's mid to large scale, right? So it's not like Mary's where it's it's um, targeted towards like a classroom environment or like a, a single family household. Um, it's definitely more mid to large scale, but it's great. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. Um, Thank you. 
Yeah, because I'm think, looking honestly, to learn. I mean, Mary did such a good job. Like what you asked, you know, what are things in there that you really, I mean, she did the dump and sort method, right? For getting the worms out where it's like, okay, <laughs> put the light over it. Like you dump it, you put a light on top. They 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 go away from the light and away from the, the heat of the lamp. And then you pull all the material off and now you have your worms, you know, to give to a friend or to sell or whatever. So, I mean, for small scale systems, like I haven't been able to improve upon the dump and sort, right? Like I still <laughs> did the dump and sort for like decades <laughs> after reading this. So I, I think honestly, this is really the definitive volume, right? Like I don't think anyone's tried to, and, and she did an update, right? She did the, um, the second edition with some new information in there. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of like kind of online material, but I know in the master composter program in Tompkins County, we relied on, on her books a lot too. And that's what um, went into a lot of the uh, educational materials that we shared with our volunteers. All right. Uh, a question uh, along those lines is I'm sure you learned a lot along the way as uh, fruit flies. Can you give people, <laughs> yeah, see, <laughs> can you yeah. give people <laughs> tips on uh, messing with fruit flies? My, the my best, I'll give my tip and I'll, I'll listen to, to yours. But so I use pantyhose. So I'm really good at making fruit fly traps, but that's a bad sign, right? Because like, yeah, I don't yeah. know that I need to trap it. So, yeah, like I'm not allowed to burn a compost in the house anymore. You can ask my husband about that. He's like, I'll build you a shed in the backyard or the garage. Like you can do whatever you want. Just like, please don't do it in the kitchen anymore. I struggled with the with the fruit flies for sure. I mean, the number one thing is to make sure there's no exposed like fruit or vegetables. Like you have to have a layer of bedding on top because um, the adult fruit flies really only lay their eggs directly on that rotting stuff, right? So yeah, I mean, bedding management, making sure if you're feeding it, like dig down, feed it, but cover that all the way over. Um, I also had good luck with you know, a lot of the systems that come with a ventilated lid, they don't necessarily have a filter. Um, and I would use old t-shirts. Um, so, okay, like you take an old t-shirt, you cut a square out of it and you duct tape it there. So yeah, the air is coming through, but absolutely no flies can get in. And that one works for the fungus gnats too, at least until you take the lid off. Um, and then I would also say when you're managing your food scraps before you put them in, um, again, having them covered like that ventilated, you don't, because I've seen people, they're like, oh, well, I put it in a five gallon bucket and I really get that lid on there. I'm like, oh, it's going to smell horrible <laughs> like a week later. Yeah. When you oh. yeah. So what I would always um, like experiment with myself and then give as a tip in master composter training was like, all right, got your five gallon bucket. You cut a hole in the lid and you duct tape a T-shirt on top and there's your filter. Right. So your stuff smells nice. It doesn't get all gross but it wasn't exposed to any like fruit flies. So then you have fewer of like the little larvae um, in the material. So it's important to think about fruit flies when you're handling the scraps, collecting the scraps, storing the scraps, and then when you're feeding and making sure that that, that top layer is always covered with bedding and that no adult fruit fly could actually get down there to lay an egg. Yeah, those those are good tips and i've but I'm ju this. just quickly are fruit flies inherently bad or just more of a nuisance no uh, it's uh <laughs> when you're cohabitating with other humans who are like what are you doing <laughs> yeah <it's... laughs> that's, that's the usual so have you ever had a crawl off um because i have <laughs> uh, just a slight one and it got a little too dry. It's like my word, you were mentioning how things get too wet. I never had problems with when it was too wet. It was when things were drying out is when they would they would hit the road. I was new to it. I was just a couple months in. So it was like a new bin and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I was experimenting at work in the larger system. I was experimenting at home. I don't know what I did, but... Luckily, I still lived in a studio apartment and I hadn't moved in with my boyfriend, who's now my husband, because um, I literally had every worm in that bin crawl up the walls of my kitchen and then die. Oh, man. So that was <laughs> that was like a horror show. I walked into that and I was like, oh, good morning. <laughs> like, I'm going to need some more coffee. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's a living system and they are like they're animals and you have to like know what. Yeah. So um, I've done that. It's it happens. And I think. Things like that, like, 
for people that are new to it and maybe want to try it, but maybe you're like super grossed out by stuff like that. It's always hard when you're, when you're dealing with like the public who comes to a warm composting class. Like I want to try it. I want to try it at home, but I'm super squeamish about this, 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 and this. And it's kind of like, well, you know, I don't want to scare you, but like there, if you do it wrong, like there's a chance they all might crawl up your kitchen wall. Right. So, (laughs) so you, you want to give people clear information of like what they're getting themselves into, right. It's a living system and you have to take care of them like you know they're your responsibility once you have them in there um they're living creatures but uh yeah but you also don't want to scare them with the things that can go a little bit sideways and it it never happened again right so who knows what i did i was just learning i i got some books i met mary appelhoff i started reading more and i never had that happen again so cool that's the 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 there's a lot of uh, trials and tribulations with those indoor bins. Yeah. So it, it, it takes a brave person to to really get into it and stick with it because uh, it took a lot of uh, talking on my end too to, with my wife Yeah. before we were married. It's like, okay, yeah, that happened, but let me try to do better next time, you know, because <laughs> you know, it is your kitchen. There's a lot of places where you're keeping these things. So I went from the kitchen and uh, she didn't like the fungus growing in there she didn't like that being in the kitchen the fruit flies are obviously a problem and stuff like that so then i went to the garage and then it really started cooking when i had it out in the garage because then i had a little bit more freedom and that the black soldier flies showed up and i was like yeah i'm really doing something right here and as the uh, uh, but it's it was just uh, steps along the way to now i don't have plastic bins at all i've got this big rock thing going on but it's yeah it's you're paid, you're, you're rewarded for all of the persistence of getting it right. Because it, I, I kind of, I, I've come a long way. I was, I was your typical boy growing up. So I was like frying worms with the magnifying glass and I would collect worms uh, for fishing with the, uh, a battery and a couple leads into the ground and all oh, of that. Cool. So I, <laughs> yeah, we, we would do stuff like that in the country. So it's, uh, so typical boy torturing worms, but now I wouldn't do something like that. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, you, you grow and you learn. But as the like I was originally started saying, the, your persistence dealing with all of these trials and tribulations, first starting off with that worm bin, you're you're greatly rewarded in the end, even if you're uh, just wanting fishing worms to deal with. And really, uh, our little composting worms don't make great fishing worms anyway, because they're so no. small. They're so but, small. Uh, yeah. And they, but, they release that weird, I, <laughs> I tried to feed some of them like in an aquarium and like they, I mean, that's why they're called fetida, right? Like fetid. They, when they're, when they're stressed out, they release a weird kind of yellow foam that smells really bad. And it's like, I don't think the fish like that either. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I'm glad I've never experienced that. that yeah. That, that's the only time I tried to like, I'm like, Oh, I'll feed them to, I was bored in lab. I don't know. I was feeding them to the aquarium in lab. And then I was like, okay, that's terrifying. I'm never doing that again. But I, I mean, I think that's why they make such a great teaching tool, right? And why so much like, you know, grade school and middle school science curriculum can be built around these and even even college level. Because uh, what I was able to do um, at Cornell when I was TAing the soil ecology lab um, and even like intro soils I TAed for two years and then soil ecology, like an upper level class I, I TAed for one year. And it was hard, right? Because you're teaching, you're teaching agriculture during the season when agriculture really isn't happening, right? Like, so where are you going to go to get a soil sample to look at, you know, uh, macroinvertebrates and and microinvertebrates and, you know, mites and springtails and all of that? Well, like the vermicompost unit allows you to keep those like alive in the classroom or the lab. So when you have your unit on like, okay, well now we're gonna study like different populations of springtails and mites and and chytraeid worms, like the little white pot worms and everything else, they're just all right there. And I still remember the first time. Um, so when I when I started grad school and I was teaching intro soils, I'm like, wouldn't it be fun, right, to take some of the stuff I did at the middle school and like incorporate that in into soil science teaching. And um, the first time I looked at a microscope, like a nice, you know, uh, dissecting scope at the vermicompost, I saw just a, one of those turtle mites crawl over. I jumped. Like, I think I screamed. <laughs> 
it's like being on Mars. And, and there, it's so amazing to learn about the other creatures too. Like the worms themselves are so compelling and so interesting, but that's why it makes such a great teaching tool is that it's not just the worms themselves. It is, it is actually a full ecosystem and you see like the trophic levels and, and all of the different things happening in there. Um, and then it, it just helps you see the whole world that way as habitats and creatures and, you know, nutrient cycling and, and all of that. So, um, yeah, there. I would if anyone has like a digital microscope, get that stuff under the microscope, and you'll you'll see some really interesting creatures and pseudoscorpions. Those are my favorite. <laughs> What's Peter got? Is he got a microscope right now? Yeah, he likes playing yeah, with that thing. thing. <laughs> yeah, no. So I was just gonna ask the uh, the. I guess I don't know if it's like a mold or a fungi, but so so this is what I pulled out of my worm bin. It didn't look like this, but then it's been in a, uh, where I store it, this stuff's been building up. Uh, huh. Yeah, I would say that looks fungal. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm Oh, whoops, sorry. Oh yeah, hold on. That was my fault. Oh, there's a little crawly. Oh, who crawled by? How did I miss it? I blinked. Uh, it was up in the left corner. I think he went back under the blob. So, it's hard to get. Hold on, let me go. That's this kind of stuff that got my worm being kicked out of the house. <laughs> nice. But th this is generally good, right? Yeah. Yeah, I imagine that any fungus in there is is benefiting things. I mean, it almost looks like there's uh like this. Looks kind of like when you're doing like an IMO collection. You can, I don't know, it's hard to keep it in focus, but. But I mean, my plants are loving. I mean, I basically mix this in with uh, either like a cocoa or a peat and then uh, some pumice and uh, the plants love it. So that that's really just all that you grow all those uh, beautiful vegetables out of, huh, Peter? Well, that that's what I'm starting to, but it's like <clears throat> to to you know, it's like I have two 55 gallon tumblers, which are kind of with the black soldier fly. It's like sort of thermophilic and sort of black soldier fly. It's like a, <laughs> uh, and then I have the worm, uh, like the four layers and uh but but i'm not producing enough fast enough so it's like i filled a i think 30 gallon or no a si yeah no a 30 or a 65 gallon container like a um actually i'll take a picture of it hold on i'll be back you guys keep going all right so th yeah, this is interesting. It's cool listening to his experiences with this too, because I it sounds like neither of us have that type of a setup any longer. Uh, you may be muted. I'm not sure. Oh yeah. So I mean, I do have a small setup, but it's outside. We just got a new place, and I am trying to figure out. And again, yeah, my husband's workshop is in the garage. I'm like, can I put a giant? I want one of those worm wigwams again. I have to say that a larger system, and maybe you've seen this too, starting with something small and moving to a larger system, the larger systems are tend to be more stable and easier to manage. Once you get it in a steady state, it like stays in that steady state. Yep. Um, and it's, it's more resilient to like perturbations or like different food that you're adding in. So I really want one of those big systems again. Um, but I have to figure out if it would make it through a, a lower Midwest <laughs> winter outside um, I've only ever done it inside like in upstate New York. And yeah, I mean, my basement was like 50 degrees, but it didn't, it didn't freeze. So I got to figure out, yeah, 
some stuff. But right now I just have a small system outside. It kind of shuts down over the winter, but then the, the worms, I mean, enough, enough cocoons are there that I, I get worms again in the spring, but there's definitely like a full die off and then they come back. Yeah. So my tip to you is rock. That's how I've been successful as I have that, uh, it's uh, landscaping stones, the ones that interlock with each other. Oh, yeah. like, uh, they build retaining walls out of mm -hmm. it. Uh, well, uh, it's the that's the outer uh, portion of it, and that's uh, to uh, pick up the sun's heat. And then inside of there, I have uh, a, a pile of rocks going up the back of it. It's basically just a horseshoe of those uh, uh, landscaping stones and then uh, a pile of just all kinds of different types of rocks. There's even, uh, they did some road work out in front of the house and left a bunch of big chunks of blacktop. And I even threw some of that in there. And you probably, the worms probably don't prefer all of that tar, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, so. I would worry about the tar, but oh, look how, how gorgeous. Yeah. So, so basically the, you know, and, and this gets to like, you know, not having enough source kind of material. So the front left one, is a hundred percent worm castings with uh, uh, sphagnum and uh, pumice. The right one, I ran out of the worm cast, so it's fifty percent worm castings, fifty percent the compost from the tumblers. Uh, I mean, they're both great; like everything's loving life right now. Um, but it's kind of fun to just see, like you know. But now, when I want to, so I'm waiting to fill up another. You know, lar I think those are 30 gallons, but it's like I got to wait for the worms to finish doing their thing before I can fill up another one and get going. So it, it's like a w w once I'm there, like I have five more of those things, I'll be in good shape. But right now it's like I only want to use stuff I make at home. And it's kind of like sometimes you just got to wait. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say rule of thumb what like kind of scientific studies and just tinkering also for vermicompost one um the the castings are so much wetter and like the structure of them you know if they get too wet in a potting media environment they can compact a little bit so usually it's like rule of thumb is no more than 20 percent casting so i'm intrigued to see yours where you're like it's basically like i mean how much peat moss do you think you have in there versus castings well, I try to do like a one third, one third, one third. Okay. Yeah, that that sounds like it. yeah. That's I mean, but it, it it was a complete eyeball. I wasn't like measuring anything. It was just like because <laughs> that's the weird thing with the vermicompost is more is not always better. You can actually get to a point where the the nutrient benefits and all the other beneficial microbes. Um, start to get outweighed by the drainage and the moisture management benefits, right? Like if you just plant in 100% vermicompost, it, it can compact a little bit and not be great for drainage or for, for root um, oxygen availability. So kind of rule of thumb is like, yeah, 20%, 30% in the mix. So how, like, what's your sense on cannabis growers? Like one, so you said you know, hydroponics, are you using the solid material in hydroponics or can you? And like, tell me about compost usage in the cannabis world, right? Like both traditional compost and the vermicompost. Well, I, w I was talking about my transition from hydroponics yes. into, <laughs> into organics. Yeah, St. Bernard's, he's a wealth of information. He's a, he's a black soldier fly guy, so he, he knows. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, and that's interesting that it's a 50-50 with biochar, because, yeah, like, biochar has really good drainage, um, like, characteristics, right? So probably drains even better than something like the peat moss. Okay, eight pallets to form four bins. Oh, nice, to rotate. Yeah, thermal first, and then the worms. That's that's a good sequence. Yeah, that, that, I've noticed that when I make that biochar, that the worms really they gravitate towards it when I when I toss it in there. Them and the roly polies. The roly polies. It's it's it's. I, I didn't. I never knew how many of them I had in there until I tossed that bio biochar in, and it was like they were mining it or something. It was it, it was almost like watching ants. You know how you can see ants like the the hive mind 
working mm-hmm. and they're, they have their goal. You don't know what it is, but they're doing something. And it was kind of the same thing watching those uh, pill bugs do the same thing. I've never seen them like working together. I've never noticed it anyway. So mm-hmm. it's, yeah. That's, and uh, the cannabis community is, it seems like that they, they're really into uh, working hard. <laughs> the, there's not the, the worm thing is it's yeah it's almost like a side note like you were talking about with the mm-hmm. uh the recycling community it's it, it, i think that the worms are kind of overlooked in a way because uh, i think people just like they they want to do something you know they they want to so i think that uh the reason why i'm not knocking jadam or knf or any of those methods or anything but it's like uh, it's it's a process and people like watching processes uh go through and uh, and it really doesn't matter to me which process is your your jam as long as you're getting to the end result that you you desire and you're not uh causing any problems for other people in, along the way so it's the but when it when it comes to organics and cannabis is worms are they're not like the popular like mm-hmm. that's not the the hit these days it's, see that <laughs> i would not have expected that like huh so that's, what vegetable growers have kind of adopted them faster than cannabis that's interesting it's, yeah that's what i've noticed because i'm mm-hmm. i'm kind of i've watched the vegetable scene like i there, there's peter's little setup right there awesome <laughs> yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah unmute yourself my man <laughs> he's just doing hand signals <laughs> He's hand gotcha. with his worm bin. <laughs> that's awesome. And and his wife hasn't kicked his out. So that, yeah, that's see? that's the beautiful thing. He, he's doing married. something right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah, that looks like this it's is the caching right? that I've taken out of the bin. Okay, good. I was gonna say see. that doesn't even look like an active I, I don't bin. want that it to all like spill on the castings. laptop, so that's <laughs> but uh this is kind of the white stuff I was talking about. So, um, but I guess, you know, you, we, hold on, let me, we, uh, we talked about the fruit flies. Like personally, I also get the, um, the little black beetles, the, the, the ones that, right. Uh, they're no, they're pretty, I, I, I got to pull some out and I'll take a picture of them or do a video. But, uh, my question, like I, cause I do it outside. I'm in LA, so it's never like frozen, freezing or anything, but, um, I know. Okay. what, what <laughs> I love about them is, is I feel like between the fruit flies, which uh, all the St. Bernard's observation booth said they do bring pathogens to the party. Mm. Uh, no, it's not rove beetles. It's the ones, um, they look and i pulled up a picture uh although i have a lot of picture here we go ah uh, wait like it's not i don't know if it's necessarily this specific one but they're definitely a little black one it, it, it's not i don't think it's this exact one but um it's like a little round i mean it looks like a it it looks like an old school volkswagen beetle basically (laughs) um but but what i if they're not negative i mean i love that because they're breaking stuff down at the top level so fast that i in my in my head uh, as not (laughs) not as an expert i'm just like i like i like the job they're doing and they don't bother me that was where I got to with the black soldier flies. The first time I saw them was in an outdoor composting unit in Oregon. And again, my housemates were like, what are you doing? There are maggots all over. This is terrifying. I'm like, yeah, but it's like a watermelon rind. Like, so I, I had to learn what they were first. Um, I used to pick them out of my worm bin because they would come in. We didn't have screens on the windows in our apartment. So they would actually, I would get black soldier flies like in my indoor worm bin. And I, I would freak out and like pull them out with tweezers. I'm like, oh, horrible. They must be like maggots and full of human disease and stuff. And then I learned what they were. And I'm like, oh, they're great. Some people compost just with these. So, yeah, my, yeah, my, they are, my they are wife, welcome visitors now. My wife is not say, as we enthusiastic. We pull them out and we feed them to the worm. I feed them to the birds. So my daughter starting at like age three. She really likes tweezers. 
So if I was gardening, if I dumped out the worm bin and that, um, and we were like dumping and sorting and starting a new bin, I would let her pick all the black soldier fly maggots out with, with tweezers. And then we'd put them by the bird feeder and the birds went nuts for that. <laughs> nuts. Yeah. Yeah, we call it catch and release uh, in my house, and my my seven year old will she'll come into the garage because they're all inside, and I always hope that I find them or she finds them before my wife sees them and freaks out and then <laughs> reminds her how. I will give you a nickel of, of for everyone my... that you catch and release back outside, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's just every day we they're like and and the when they turn into the adults and they leave the uh, the shell not the shell but the the exoskeleton behind <laughs> those are all over the floor. Uh. Yeah, we all have very understanding partners. I I currently have um, with my six year old we have a pet. A uh, praying mantis that we adopted from outside, and now we're feeding her store bought crickets because it's too cold here now for outdoor crickets, and she's doing great. Um, and then we also have two pet slugs and a terrarium, but it, it is, it's on the dining room table. And for Thanksgiving, I'm like, oh, should I move the like terrarium that's full of slugs and <laughs> isopods and stuff? Like, it's fun. We love looking at them. Um, Speak of the devil. He's uh, got a terrarium too, see? Oh, shit. <laughs> Now, hold on, it was a black soldier fly adult uh, that just, here we go. Let's see if we can get you. Holy shit. One of my heroes just showed up. Awesome. Bring him, <laughs> bring him on. You know how to do it. Yeah. Hey. What's up, Coot? How you doing? All right, man. I, 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 was a, talk I got an email from Peter, and I was kind of, I'm not kind of really excited because, uh, Mary is really a personal hero of mine. I, I want to put this in perspective. The first legitimate, I mean by academic standards, not cannabis industry standards. The first legitimate study of uh, vermicompost was in 1974. Her book was unrelated. Uh, she was not a scientist, but her book was published like six, maybe seven years after that. So her impact is nothing short of Teutonic by showing people how they could uh, handle garbage. And I, and I don't like that term, but anyway, how to, how to uh, take material that we don't need and then turn it into the most available uh, material for plants that has ever, if you don't have worm castings, you know, you're just doing a hydroponic. I mean, let's get honest here. Yeah. Buying some crap soil from uh, a grow store. I don't even name them. They're all crap. Peat moss and perlite. And then you're going to put them on a newt program because you got to feed them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because you don't have any biology. You know, you don't have any. There's no there there. It's just this static uh, bullshit that, uh, excuse me, bovine excrement that uh, is incapable of producing. I mean, you wouldn't eat, want to eat food grown in that, would you? Of course not. So, you know, I mean, I put more effort into growing cherry tomatoes than most people put in cannabis. But, I mean, it takes me two years, two and a half years to turn this into worm castings. You got to go through thermophilic, mesophilic composting, rebuild your nutrient profile at, well, in that eight, to, but most the, uh, lay person would call your curing process and then now it's ready to go and add it to the worm bins and so you have value added mesophilic compost i mean what could be better it's got to be better than a jug of crap for 700 dollars. it's supposed to you know turn your world upside down you know and anyway that's some comparisons of the the thermophilic like if you take the same feedstock right so from the same dairy and you do that hot step and then you let one of them go out and windrow in the field through the mesophilic in the curing phase. And then you take the other one right after the hot stuff and you feed it to the worms. We found that they both had the same amount of total nitrogen, but that the vermicompost had just off the charts higher plant available nitrogen. So Right. And that's the whole that's the whole point. You could take a nail and stick it in your soil and brag to all your buds, I got really good iron in my soil. Okay, yeah, you do. You stuck a nail in there. Good for you. Uh, maybe they'll do an article for you in uh, Maximum Yield or something. 
but let's talk plant available uh, bioavailability of those ions yeah. i mean it doesn't work that way it, uh, yeah. you know i mean before you even get into the big list of all the um not, let's set the macronutrients aside the ones that never want to get discussed let's talk micro you're going to have the right balance of uh molendimum with uh say uh I don't know, I can't even think. There's 83 of them. So I, I, I don't do the law of minimum. So at least 16, that's all you need. Oh, okay, good for you. Um, you know, with the, the micronutrients, the, the sulfur, the uh, the big seven, as they're called sometimes, they're all the same. It just depends what format they're in. Excuse me, what form, the copper. What form of copper? Uh, they all have, it's all the same seven, the big seven. Uh across the board whether it's uh, completely uh, salt based or the hardcore organic terrorist like myself you're still talking the same seven uh uh excuse me the same the same elements yeah just how you get there but anyway back to mary uh i i disagree and this isn't a criticism i just it's a factoid the majority of kitchen scraps are over 97, 98% water. Mm -hmm. So you have to deal with that. And water is your big enemy in vermicomposting mm -hmm. because worms breathe through their skin. And the more you water the uh, hydration level, it impedes reproduction. It impedes, worms don't eat anything. They eat except bacteria manure. That's the big fallacy, or that's the fact you have to get over when you set up a worm bin. They're not, it's not like you dump, you know, peach melba from last night and they go, oh, let's go down there, man. They got the peach melba on the south end, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, it's all, it's all, it's all microbes. It's uh, uh, primarily bacteria. That's why some of us add fungal foods to our vermicompost to attract fungal colonies so that when we're done with this process, we have a, a material that's balanced between a lot of different microbes, protozoa, fungi, bacteria. I mean, see what I mean? It's, it's a, uh, a group effort. Yeah. Anyway, that's my, that's my uh, philosophy. I almost think of the and worms under, as earthworm farmers, right? I mean, the worms yeah. themselves as microbe farmers. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, I always, the, the funniest stories I hear from people is, you know, my worms really like watermelon. Excuse me. Watermelon's over 99% water with a little bit of sugar. Once that water is dissipated into the bedding, even worms can't turn water into castings. I mean, they're magical, but they're not that magical. All right. So what are you left with? You're left with, say you put in a hundred pounds of uh, watermelon, uh, the meat, whatever. Okay, so once you reduce the water, what are you left with? Five pounds? I mean, that's a lot of hauling, right? To go get some scrap, uh, number two, as they call them in the produce industry, go get a, a big a bin of a jitney, get a big bin of uh, distressed merchandise and get rid of 99.5% water, you didn't pay for the gas. <laughs> yeah. So my deal is, I think you're better off to start with compost. Good compost. I'm not real big on the whole thermophilic, but I understand the laws. You want to get it up over 140 to kill pathogens. Okay, so that's another issue. I'm just set that one off the table. But that's where you're that's where you're going to get really good development in terms of your uh, reproduction. And not only that, but the length and girth of the worms. It's not true that bigger worms make bigger, uh, better castings, but it is true. They make bigger castings, which means they're not quite as muddy. Mm -hmm. One of the pr challenges of using the blues, the ones that they're called Malaysian blues, but they're not from Malaysia and they're called Hawaiian blues, even though they're not from Hawaii, they're actually from Kashmir, the base of the Himalayas, but that's another story. And they're not blue, but anyway, those they have they're very tiny. 
in both in length and girth, and so they make smaller castings. So when you use them in a potting soil, it's important to up your amendment, excuse me, aeration level to take into consideration that uh, the hydration level that's in those smaller castings. That just comes from my own personal experience. When Maybe I, I need dryers. Muddy because they it can get a little muddy if you're working with just the the pure vermicompost. It's just it's super wet. Right. It needs right. to be mixed with other stuff for potting media. Well, my so-called soil is a. Hey Jim, just just quickly, I think with your Bluetooth earbuds, it's do you guys hear the crackling? Yeah, we got a crackle. Maybe just hold on. I got, I got a mic. I got a, I got a USB microphone. Be right back. Amazing. So did did you guys see? Uh, <laughs> I found one. So do we know what kind of beetle that is? No, I think you got yourself something that is only in California. I've never seen one of those in a worm bin. Okay, because they love my worm bin. Let me. What are people these. saying in the chat? Someone must have seen one before. Uh, and do you have the iNaturalist app? I'm kind of obsessed with that. Citizen Science, really good species ID insects, plants, everything right. else. Oh, he's cute. Yeah, they're chill. Although now he's... Testing, testing. He's super cute. I don't know what kind of beetle it is. The antenna make me think weevil, but the snout doesn't make me think weevil, so. Get a still and we'll, uh, I'll upload it to iNaturalist for you and see what they say. Yeah, where's Zenthanol when you need him? Hey, Coot, can you say something again? How's I think that crackled. How's that? Perfect. Yeah, that's good. Okay. That's a road, uh. $99 microphone, get one. It worked really well. So the uh, USB, uh, it's called the, uh, hold on a minute. USB mini, your $99, get the whole shot. Uh, plus this really cool software that has like soundtracks to it. Uh, so you can do a podcast like I want to do that. But anyway, you can have clapping and cheering and, you know, whatever. So. All that for 99 bucks, pretty good deal. You, you can be an instant star. <laughs> I want to be somebody. But anyway, uh, oh, yeah, I want to say one thing about uh, the uh, soldier flies. My worm guy, who's, I've mentioned him uh, dozens of times, uh, he's here in the Northwest, and he's been doing this for over 45 years, including Alaska at one point in his career. Um, he decided to get into, uh, selling the larva and then the, the reactor, I think they call them reactors or anywhere where you store the things or raise them or whatever you do with them. I couldn't believe it when he told me, he, I was his first customer when he opened up here in the Northwest many years ago. I took my, uh, Craigslist, I found him and I took a bucket. That's the only way I buy castings. It's gotta be in a bucket. If it's in a bag, leave it. You know, you're, you're just uh, buying heartache. And uh, once it goes in a bag, the clock starts on its uh, yeah. worthless. Especially after you figure it sits in a, a pallet out in the sun in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, at a garden center. What do you think it's like after about a day? Imagine three weeks. Oh, yeah, pasteurized. Yeah, <laughs> yeah done, over, O-V-A-H. Um, but anyway, he's, he's making like bank on selling these... Uh, this larva and uh, because they're in and around, this is a small farm, maybe five acres, you know, just for vermicompost, but he did build a big, uh, what do you call them? Those uh, metal sheds. I don't know. There's a term for it. Uh, but anyway, so he's in there he's shipping them all over the United States. And uh, I was hysterical because uh I don't like them. I, I, I have I had them in my worm bins. Excuse me. I've had them in my uh, compost piles. And all of a sudden, I walk out there and like stick a uh, pitchfork in it, you know, to turn it. And all of a sudden, the whole thing's moving. 
it's just it's a little weird for me so uh that was my first experience with them too it was like oh my gosh <laughs> yeah 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 so right um Yeah, uh, let's not go there. It's it's about the chitin thing, but that's that's another discussion for another day. So it's actually chitinase what's important, not chitin. Yeah. But that's another story. So those of us who have been around a little bit might remember a product many years ago called Kytosan. That was a uh, pesticide. It's still available, but yeah, uh, you know, say it's still around. Yeah. These products go in and out of fashion, you know. Oh, well, that's, you know, they, we used that three years ago. We're on to, you know, blah, blah, blah. But what, how chitosan is made is that chitin is a polysaccharide. It's a acetyl form of glucosamine. And some, okay, all seashells are made from calcium carbonate. However, crustaceans create that in layers, and those layers are held together by a layer of glucosamine. So... When we add things like crab meal, lobster meal, uh, crawdads, uh, what's it? Oh, shrimp. We're adding chitin to the soil, and bacteria cannot touch chitin. But in their feeble attempt to, they create an enzyme called chitinase. And it's the chitinase that deconstruct the insect eggshells, preventing um, uh, them to mature the larva. So you're arresting them. Nematodes so it's the, too. You're the right, the right. stage of the nematodes is all chitin on right. the outside. Exactly. Oh, sweet. But you got a little larva of somebody. I was going to say to Peter, is Peter, when you do like a, a, what I call big is say, I don't know, how about 100 gallons? That's only half a yard. How's that? If you do a 100 gallon uh, worm, vermiculture setup and it's outdoors i promise you you're going to drive yourself nuts trying to identify each and every organism that is shows up in your pile you just got to kind of like trust that it's all going to work out well they all got to function at the junction uh, so. I, I actually i'm not driving myself crazy i i love them yeah, but they're not harmful. They're 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 shredders. They're yeah, no, the, the, these guys go to town and they're awesome. That's what beetles do. And then you look at in, in especially in jungle areas of the world where you have dung eating beetles. I mean, they're so integral to the whole ecology, soil biology. They can't be overstated. Uh, some people try to run a worm bin like I don't know. Like they're in a suit with a press shirt and a tie. I mean, this is as basic as it gets. Working with all these organisms to turn out a material that's going to make your plants explode and wonderful, whether it's tomatoes or can it doesn't matter. We I use it on my, uh, well, my wife does, on her house plants, man. It's a jungle in this place. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you got shit growing everywhere. That's, that's how it ought to be. As, as you're talking about all of the stuff that shows up in these bins, as that's just as, that's always been a sign to me that you're you're doing it right. And absolutely, you can't, you can't get freaked out when things start showing up that you're seeing in the topsoil outside because that's essentially what we're creating here. Well, that's uh, another good example. This one really cracks me up. I've had this one several times over the years. Because I advocate of putting in fungal foods. Well, guess what? It shows up. And so you're going to have mycelium. Oh, my God. What, what, should I spray it? No, don't spray it. That's that's what you're trying to get is mycelium. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Where'd you, where'd you learn to grow? Oh, George Cervantes. Oh, okay. Good deal. Uh, I'll leave it at that. He told, he told people to bake their soil to kill the germs. What are, you, what are you going to set up pizza ovens out on a cannabis farm? All right, let's roll the next batch through, and we'll take it up to three seventy-five. You know, hold the parmesan. I've you know. seen in in place in situ steam pasteurization of soils uh, in greenhouses in the Netherlands, where they have like they're running forty years continuous lettuce 
um, yeah. in field soil with a glass house on top of it. And the only yeah. way they can do that is they put a tarp down and then they steam pasteurize to get out the verticillium uh, macrosclerosis. Right. Um, but they are switching over to kind of doing biological soil disinfestation of like, okay, well, yeah, you want, you've got to get rid of certain pathogens, but how can you do that in sure. a better way without using all that natural gas? And they, they, they've been developing different blends. Okay. Sawdust, this, this, and this spread it on the soil, put the tarp down, let it heat up for a certain amount of time. Like then pull the tarp off, till it in yep. and like, you don't have as much of the verticillium. So it's, it's neat to see like. It's not really composting, but it's using the concept of composting sure. um, for, for managing soils in a better way, especially in those. Uh, I've never seen a greenhouse with just field soil. I'm like, wait, how does that? But it's a thing. No, no. I, um, please understand this, that long before it went legal here, cannabis, this state is one of the major horticulture states with about... 1,100 producers, which isn't a lot, they generate close to $2 billion a year in uh, sales, yeah. uh, gross revenues, everything from bare uh, tree stock, which literally they pull the, the sapling out of the ground and they're shipped that way, uh, cuts down costs. And then you have the ones that's like an ice cream scoop on the front of these uh, tractors that actually digs out the root ball and those are wrapped and that's a root ball tree. And then you got the container stuff at like you see at Home Depot or Lowe's, you know, in springtime, all that horrible Arbor Vita, uh, you know, but anyway, that part doesn't matter. But so we've had a lot of greenhouses, but nothing approached the silliness that went on four or five, six years ago when it went legal here. I mean, it was hysterical to watch. I've seen more money go into greenhouses than I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm pretty old. How many and are still I just, operational? Like, was it just a boom and a crash or? Yeah. Yeah. It, the first year was a disaster. And then not just that, their incompetence because they're working off of spreadsheets, you know, guys with uh, loafers and daddy's car they got in college and, you know. And they're going to plan this out and get the right uh, return on investment and all that silliness. Um, so, and, and, and I mean, I mean, money that I, I've never seen spent before to control the light in a greenhouse to have movable panels. You know, so I want to run my day at night. Uh, OK. And I want to run my night during the day, you know, that kind of stuff. Why? Uh, I don't know. I just seemed like, you know, I read, I heard. Well, somebody told me, oh, good. Well, you should stay off cannabis boards. But in any event. Um, hey, when, man, that's how I learned about you. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really funny. I heard this the other day from a fellow. There's a, a magazine called Acres USA, and it's been around for 50-something years, 51. Um, yeah, every year they have a uh, – it moves around, but it's always in the Midwest, this uh, – trade show called eco farm and what's really fit because it's always in the midwest you get a lot of mennonites you get a lot of the, the uh, amish farmers and they've been doing what i would call sustainable agriculture for decades if not you know centuries i mean their roots go really deep into into german and the whole uh rudolf steiner but that's not my point um, and at those shows, you got real producers. They're like doing the loop key compost method that was, I mean, Peter did a whole show on it with Linda, Dr. Linda Chalker Scott. You can explain that the whole, but the loop key family in Austria, uh, microbial controlled, uh, composting. That's where I, where I learned you know, start out with rock dust. Excuse me. I want to be really clear because um, that word gets has gotten really maligned in the cannabis scene with basalt or granite, paramagnetic rock dust and starting from the very beginning of the composting process. And then I only take it up as what's uh, legally mandated, which is in Oregon. And it it's going to be different in other states to so 141 because that doesn't compost anything. You can't compost at 140. You can't even fry an egg at 140. 
So once you let it down and it drops below 100 and you're in the 99 to 68, 67, you're in the mesophilic and now we can start adding nutrient dense materials. We can start adding uh, a lot of things that was going to build both the microbial colonies because you've destroyed them in that uh, uh, thermophilic, taking it up to 140. You pretty much neutralized whatever microbial colonies there. So now we've got, and that's why you got to keep turning it so that the microbes that land on the surface get moved into the center. So the constant turning of the compost is um, a key before you even think about putting it in a worm bin. And then I poison it. I do things that I, I've learned over the last year that anything that works it's, you're going to get uh, some silliness about it, you know. So kelp now is, uh, you don't want to use kelp because it will do something, uh, cause your toes to fall off or, I don't know, your fingers get stubby. And yeah, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, what are some of the others? Oh, yeah. Uh, don't put any barley malt. Even though the human race has been working with malted barley for what? Mm, 5,000 years? 6,000 years? Okay. But we, we don't want to use that. And, of course, the big one, neem. Ooh, ooh. Neem is able to, and the science is clear, suppresses uh, uh, patho uh, pathogenic fungi and enhances and increases the good guys, for lack of a better word. As a matter of fact, in India, where a lot of oyster mushrooms are grown, Neem is, is typically added to the substrate of growing that to uh, control contaminants. How does that work? You know, so anyway, I put that in my soil and also my compost. And, uh, you know, I see, I see my ceiling all the time. That's when I'm going, yay, all right, we're, we're dancing. You know, we're going to end up with some really good vermicompost. There you go. And for your finished product, like who who are the end users? Do you use like, yeah, like what's the breakdown in terms of types of farmers? Because we were just talking before. I thought for sure the cannabis industry was like super into vermicompost, but it's like, oh, maybe no, the vegetable growers have kind of gone no. there first. I, I'll tell you the best people to sell to because they're legitimate agronomists are what, when I was a young man, they used to refer to as truck farming, mm -hmm. uh, small crops that you would take into the central markets in the cities. And now with uh, sat the uh, Saturday market, farmer's market concept over the last, developed over the last 25, 30 years, the more uh, common term is market producers. Mm -hmm. And so and I, that's a neat thing experience too, because when you go to those uh, venues and you're buying your uh, fruits and vegetables for your family, you get a chance to talk to them. I always tell people, well, I can't find anything. I said, well, go to your local farmer's market and talk to a producer and ask him, you, you think they're using ocean forest? You know, I mean, come on. Uh, or some other, something equally disreputable. Um, but those are the ones that you take. You, mine look like uh, coffee grounds. When I get done, I can take it my hands and like sand and it runs through my uh, a fist of it. It'll just run out like I grabbed uh, dry sand. Almost pure castings then, like yeah. almost pure castings, yeah. I'm, I'm about, I try, I shoot for 70, 30, 70% 70 mm -hmm. castings and then 30% processed, but not, uh, uh, I mean, the microbial activity will deconstruct the pieces of the, verm, of the uh, compost, but they, they're not castings. I mean, mo the studies, in fact, for anybody out there wanting the best program that I've ever participated in, quite frankly, ever uh, seen on this type of venue or otherwise, is the one that Peter did on uh, vermicompost. I mean, you had people that headed up the largest operation in the Western Hemisphere, Worm yeah. Power and, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Yasmin Cardoza, uh, I can't remember, uh, the ge gentleman in uh, Hawaii, who was one of the Norm editors. Of, yes. Yeah. Are you Rhonda Sherman? Oh no, I'm not Rhonda. I love Rhonda. Oh, okay. I'm I'm Allison Jack. So I, oh, okay. I kind of helped moderate that day of worms a year ago. Yeah. I collaborated with Howard during my uh, PhD yeah. dissertation and did a lot of work with their yeah. material. That was an impressive facility. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I followed Rhonda's career for, I don't know, 15, maybe 20 a years. New book out. I, I just gave her a shout out before you came on. She has a new book out for mid to large scale uh, vermicomposting. That's quite good at Chelsea Green. Is that the second book? Or am yeah. I, do I have one. Uh, it's got a gray cover with a, a graphic of a worm on it. Let me it's look the it one up. It just came out in 2018, so it's relatively new. Oh yeah, that's the one I have. Okay, yeah, yeah. and I, and I've recommended it to uh, a lot, dozens, and unfortunately, I, I don't want to uh, be the bearer of bad news. So um, no, vermicompost is not a big deal in the cannabis scene. The cannabis scene is made up of instant gratification, uh, hopey and dopey. Um, I don't want to really put any effort in this. Um, and it shows in the dispensary stuff. It's uh, horrible. I mean, just go get a brick out of Mexico and, you know, go through it. You'd probably be better off. Um, it's just, it's, it's horrible. I had, I had a sample the other day and the guy was all like, say, he goes, look what I did. So I took a hit and it tasted like ivory soap. Well, you really got this terpene thing really dialed in. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is wow. this is what this was your goal, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad I'm retired. It's gone down overall with legalization. Oh, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. It's the, and then you have the black market scene. Uh, I can't. I'm only going to speak about Oregon because I don't read the news in California, but I know it goes on, and I know Washington. I mean, there was a bust the other day here. Just just one, just one, five hundred thousand pounds. And guess what you have there? Slave labor. People living and sleeping, I mean, uh, you know, smuggled in from third world countries, Central America, Mexico. Um, this isn't Woodstock, you know. Um, this is hustle. Uh, let's rip people off. And uh, what I want to know is, what do you do with a half million pounds of dope? And you supposedly there's this rigid system about where dispensaries get it. Okay, that's all right, whatever. So where are they taking this to Mexico? I mean, and that was just one. We've had over the last uh, well over two, uh, let's see, two million pounds uh, since the middle of uh, October, and not just in one area. It's not just Southern Oregon. There's one up here. Uh, a place that I drive by three or four times a week. It's like really big estates, you know, horse property where they have training barns and all that makes really good, uh, drying chambers, I guess. And, uh, yeah, there's one even over in the desert uh, east of the Cascades. So, uh, this is hardcore, you know, cartel stuff. This isn't yeah. a bunch of ex hippies decided I mean, they have one last blast. I mean, They've got the slave labor. They've got, and it's all chemicals. I read about it's, the one on the Navajo Nation. It was all trafficked labor. It was terrifying. Yeah. It is. I mean, there's been murders down south. I mean, one case, a uh, car pulls up and a corpse is just dumped on the doors of the hospital. Uh, the the state agency, this is rural. In some areas, they have to use helicopters for traffic control because you can't, it's not pro, uh, feasible to run a car. If you're going to check the uh, speeders on the road between A and B and it's 300 miles through the mountains, you know, you don't use, use drones or helicopters or whatever. So, but yeah, so, and they're and steaming water. I mean, there are people down there who've lived there for decades, families, their aquifers have been emptied with, uh, these, uh, you know, uh, black market grows. I'm a big promoter. I help as many personal use in Oregon. We have, uh, every not person, but household is allowed, uh, four plants and doesn't say how big or small your pots can be. So I, I put them in 800 gallon pots and then grow them up about 15 feet and harvest eight or nine pounds, call it a day. Don't whine about the dispensaries. Grow your own. You got the legal right to do it. You know, keep your mouth shut. You do you know. still just grow the one? Is it? Is I that and I have it. Bread and butter? Yeah, that and I have. Uh, yeah, that one's going to be thirty nine in January. Uh, so much for genetic drift. And then um, 
its uh, stepdaughter, which is named after my dog, Agnes, uh, the bulldog, uh, the Agnes Cup, which is a cross between uh, the T.O., and which is primarily Thai. And then I didn't know this until years and years and years after I got it, but a seed that I got in the 88, 89 that I was told came from Oregon. And uh, I had, I mean, a group of seeds. It wasn't it was just, uh, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't that cool yet. We just had to have seeds, you know, you didn't pass around cuts and it wasn't all groovy yet. <laughs> and, um, as it turned out, and I had a chance to talk to his son online, it was from DJ Short on his path to go from here to get to the, what was it, Blueberry, I think. So he was using a Highland tie, and this was one branch that didn't make it for whatever reason, not because of quality, but probably because of structure and, you know. Anyway, it's called Velvet Rush. And so I asked, and I had somebody had told me many years before I, that's one of DJ shorts. So when I had the chance to talk to his son, his, his son said, yeah, I remember that. So I had sent the seeds to Hawaii because Oregon's too wet to really do a good job as far as breeding seeds it, with the TO cuts and a friend of mine there crossed him. And so that's the one I'm growing now. And uh, it's a monster. I mean, you know, some people like to ban him around that term hybrid vigor. And then there's others of us that know what we're doing and really know how to bring it out and maximize the genetic potential. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a and then I, I we crossed it with a, a fellow uh, that was growing in Maui back in 75, 74. And this gr seed group he took he's kept it alive you know all these years and so he uh found some really nice males and he crossed and we got a bunch of seeds from that so we're going to pass those out to patients because they're the ones that get brutalized in this system more than anybody else uh everybody was really always really concerned about the patients you know right um so just give them uh you know we pass out cuts and pass out seeds and uh the so-called coots mix, you know, you, if you just make a half-ass attempt, you're going to get a decent plant, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I'm not that still... smart. It's, it's not, I'm not that smart. It's not rocket science, you know, it's basic, uh, you know, sphagnum peat moss, ver vermicompost and pumice, and then, you know, some newts, whatever you want to call it. I mean, not newts in a bottle. I mean, like kelp meal, uh, some basalt, some uh, neem, and just for the humor of the kids, I put in, uh, instead of limestone, I use uh, oyster shell because it's, it's 50 cents cheaper a bag and it sounds cooler. Sounds really so. cool. <laughs> uh, well, your thing is proven though. Like you were using this on your in your nursery for decades and uh, right. raising trees for years. And it's like, it's not, it's not like the Coots mix is just something that uh, no. wasn't like uh keeping your business going for years that's it's kind of that's kind of important and it's, it's kind of branched off like uh build a soil you you still have uh, a, a so uh oh <laughs> so, oh no, no 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 i do no no i do in fact <laughs> okay. i talked to i talked to jeremy this week I, I i bought a uh a 10 by 10 gorilla tent for a friend he's they're setting up a uh culinary and uh medicinal uh uh, mushroom uh, fruiting chamber. So uh, doing lion's mane, uh, some really weird forms of reishi, uh, uh, cordyceps, things like that, that are people, uh, some of us uh, that microdose use Paul, uh, Paul Stamets uh, method of what he calls stacking. So you take this tiny, tiny amount of psilocybin mushroom and then along with two grams of lion's mane, along with the one I don't do, but I'm supposed to, I don't like it, niacin, the stuff that makes your skin feel all weird. So anyway, he refers to it as stacking. And lion's mane has been, is really important for uh, people with declining cognitive capacity as we get older, 
we lose uh not me but of course uh, but anyway so you say so you lose some of that uh you know you're not 100 percent of your game and even in in asia it's been uh researched in tokyo and, and uh, beijing uh, treating of uh, early alzheimer's of not c- curing it but being able to stem the tide so to speak so you can p- find a place uh that's but and also these you know uh, lion's mane for example you cut them in like uh three-eighths or half-inch thick steaks and you saute them in butter with uh, some herbs and it tastes like lobster so it's it's it really a widely does. It, it has that seafood flavor it's so weird yeah i put it in yeah. stir fries you're like oh yeah okay <laughs> now you, here's the part you really like is that in the world of uh home growing your own at home kind of thing it's one of the easiest and yeah, so, I got a kid, I think, from North yeah, It was right. so easy. It was exactly. so easy. And it, yes. I threw a monster one and put it in my Thanksgiving stuffing last year. There you go. Yes. you got uh, Those kits are wonderful for people who aren't insane like me that, you know, bought a, or had one built, a $2,000 flow hood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Jesus. I mean, okay, it's not a blower. It's an air pump. It's 1350 uh cubic feet per minute <laughs> so i mean it's and then and then the the actual uh filter is uh the hepa filter is oh, yeah. is yeah, two by two foot square and then 12 inches thick nice. oh i know that i mean i know that uh feed yeah for sure yeah check out uh fresh cap uh mushroom at youtube uh he, he's serious he's up in canada and uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah. In my opinion, that's all it is. Is that the cannabis thing is going to do whatever it is they're going to do, good, better, and different. All right, uh, but there's some real potential for people that want to, you know, like the psilocybin mushrooms are really important for end of life patients trying to deal with dealing with not trying to you got and you don't have any choice you're dealing with your mortality and things that uh psychiatry isn't equipped to handle and then you get into the treatment of anxiety and depression and also uh the treatment of ms by helping to repair the nerve endings and for diabetics too neuropathy uh so these these uh this microdosing there's it's and we have it legal now in Oregon. The research is now legal to research, legitimate research, not, okay, guys, uh, here you go. Now, uh, give me a call in an hour. Let me know how it's going. You know, that kind of silliness. But uh, so there's a, kind of like a we don't care anymore attitude. It's, I don't hear about people getting harassed because they grow in some mushrooms. I mean, this is, you know, with a small L, Oregon is very much a, a libertarian philosophy, live and let live, you know. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, we got assholes, there's no question about it, but uh, we don't we don't elect them, you know, so. Uh, yeah, mushrooms, I think, is the future. I mean, I, I, Paul Stamets has, made, I've seen him several times, he, he does uh, fundraisers for the uh, psilocybin people that we, got the law passed and he said states over and over and i i don't mean that in a negative way but yeah mushrooms will save can save the human race and on on so many levels i mean think if we all used uh soil remedial here's one for you okay so let's say that i lost my mind and got a cannabis license and that's like an acre i guess here forty thousand square feet okay and I couldn't afford like really good Willamette Valley uh, soil. And I had to go to a place where it wasn't quite as together. So you could take pieces of cloth. You'd probably you'd want to use in my, I would anyway, like say uh, non-sprayed burlap or cotton, denim, uh, untreated cotton, those kinds of things. And you could inoculate that with mycelium and then you could let it dry. And then you could, after you clear the, whatever it is off the land, 
you could lay those down and hydrate them, and now you're going you, you're into soil remediation, micro remediation, which is a lot more effective than getting a big ass tractor. And what do those guys make? Four hundred bucks an hour? You know? Did you want me to stop? Yeah, you know, keep flipping the hundreds. You know, and uh, so you could do this with microbiology. That's amazing. And it's being used. There's a gentleman by the name of Trad Cotter. Oh yeah, a book. he's he's great. Yeah. I met him at a conference years ago. Um, yeah, he's got a great YouTube channel. I yep. yeah, I recommend following him for sure. Well, his book uh, is titled "Organic Mushroom Farming and Myco Soil Remediation." I think is mandatory for anybody. For example, let's say. Uh, well, this actually was a situation, a person wanting to be a semi you know, big grower, bought all these bags of uh, commercial potting soil. And uh, I told him the first thing I would do is take it out of the bags, put it on a tarp and hit it with uh, some uh, grow kits of uh, oyster mushrooms. Nice. And so they mixed it all that uh, spawn, grain spawn inside and let it go. And But within, I don't know, five weeks, maybe it looked like it had snowed. I mean, it just there was mycelium everywhere. I said, now you got something to work with. Now, now you got some biology here. And I would get a bunch of worm castings from this guy. This is a local filler. filler and so and his uh, plants came out amazing. Just amazing. Um yeah the real deal you know like 15 foot tall kind of stuff yeah you know it takes uh, it take let's see eight or nine people to join hands and get around them you know i don't understand the stuff that looks like the christmas tree off of peanuts you know the one with the the towel around the base with a real straggly uh branching and I, I thought when you grew crops you're supposed to go for the gusto go big or go home right <laughs> exactly I mean, just candy ass growing is what I would call it. We were talking uh, about this at the beginning of the show before you came on is that, that how easy this actually is and people overcomplicate it. And as uh, she was talking earlier about uh, 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 commercial applications, uh, the, how uh, large farms are uh, starting to listen to the organic point of view a little more than they used to in the past so it's yeah. uh, things are changing for the better but it seems like the cannabis community is a little bit slow to catch on the thing when things are easier on your back they're easier on your wallet and they're it's just you all were talking about running a tractor those guys get paid well because diesel is expensive the tractor is expensive the maintenance on that thing so it says if there, there's a lot to farming that people don't know oh i believe me Believe me, and that's why I say when when the thing came in here, that, you know, the, there were two licenses. There was a twenty thousand, which is basically a little bit shy of a half acre, and then the forty thousand square foot, which is a little bit shy of an acre. I've never seen such silliness. I mean, I know farmers here that do tomatoes, you know, two hundred acres with less fanfare than these guys did on a half acre. Yeah. You're going to do what? You know, just like, where did you get that? Oh, off of uh, a weed farm, you know. Oh, good. That's, that's right. That'd be my source. You know, the, the University of Oregon has a school of agriculture. <laughs> you know that, don't you? And you know that you could log in and, and pull all kinds of legitimate research, not, well, I think, I feel, you know, the, the touchy-feely uh, cannabis scene. You know. Yes, uh, most university libraries. Oh, sorry. No, I, was, I was just saying, uh, letting the audience know that uh, state university libraries are an open resource for you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, here's one. Here's a good one. Um, because of the volcanic soils that we have in the Northwest, because the whole Cascade Range is a string of, of volcanoes, um, we grow the best barley in the world. Why is that important? Because every culture makes beer. So we ship malted barley out of here like you wouldn't believe great western malt has a big operation right on the river that separates vancouver and portland and they're taking shiploads over to japan china india australia 
so the University of Oregon has a portal called Barley World. If you want to know anything about barley, how to grow it, the varieties, the, the history, go to Barley World. You don't listen to somebody on, you know, a weed, you know, forum thing. I mean, I've heard some some stupid shit in my life, but some of the stuff that comes out from the people trying to protect their little fiefdom of uh, bullshit is just amazing to me. Well, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, Oregon has one of the best university hosted annual cannabis conferences, right? For cannabis research. Oh yeah. I mean, it's look, let me get, you want to talk cannabis. I'd let, that would be a good thing. So 50 years ago in 71, there was an attempt, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I'm wrong, 50, 72. <coughs> Oregon was the first state to decriminalize cannabis. So if you got caught with 28 grams or less, it wasn't a misdemeanor. It was like a parking ticket. I mean, it cost more. Don't, don't get me wrong. They got their C note, 100 bucks, which in 71 was you know, a fair amount of money. But you weren't going to jail. You weren't going to go, you know, just, okay, don't do that again. And mostly you have to watch the cop take it out and shake it on the ground and rub, his, you know, rub it in the sidewalk with his boot. Um, so that set a tone. There has always, was always a, yeah, who cares kind of thing. Here's how I got, here's how I got to move here. It was in 88. I came up here. I just wanted to check out Oregon and I'm in downtown Portland, right where the university of Portland is Portland state university. And so there's a lot of buses, you know, going to different places. It's, uh, afternoon late afternoon early evening and i watched this young man on the corner he had a like a uh like a detective's coat like overcoat you know kind of like a raincoat thingy and he pulls a bong out and he takes a hit while he's waiting for the bus and i turned to my wife and i said this is where i want to live and so we went home and uh you know sold our home and um yeah, I arrived up here 34 years, and here I am 34 years later. So, but so I'm just talking about the history. We're not the first state to set up a medical. Right. We were not even close, but we passed it in '78, and it was so good that it became the model for many other states to do a Me Too. Uh, what it allowed was, uh, I think initially it was eight conditions that a doctor could legally, if they would, and most wouldn't could sign you off that got you a card for this reason. And then later they added a couple more and I don't remember that whole scenario, but legalization killed the whole thing. Here's why in order to get a card, you had to go to a doctor who would sign. So there's two fifty, Okay. And then the state realized, well, we're making a lot of money on this. They raised the cost from a hundred dollars a year to $200. So now we're at $450. So I could grow six plants. When they made it legal here and anyone could grow four with no paperwork, I'm going to pay you $450 so I can grow two extra plants. I mean, have you ever seen any of my giants that I put online? Some of like, you know, the really big ones. I've had, I've had, I've had one uh, consultant who should really get a new line of work. Well, you know, when you have that much uh, leaf, that takes a lot to trim it. Well, listen, Cupcake, I don't want to interrupt your thinking, but that's kind of the whole idea. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, that's the only time that I, sometimes you got to thin it out a little bit for airflow and stuff. Oh, like no, that, no, but, no. Yeah. yeah, I know. But yeah, I mean, hey, it's just look, what do leaves do? Leaves do one thing. They convert sunlight into sugar. Yeah. I mean, that's it's like the sails yeah. of a ship. The clipper ships had more sails than a sailboat. <laughs> I mean... You know, think about it for a minute. Can you imagine a farmer with, uh, say, 3,000 acres? And that's not even a big farm uh, for grain. Say he had 3,000 acres of wheat. Okay, I need you to send over 10,000 workers. We're going to go out and we're going to trim the tops of these uh, wheat plants. I mean, think about it. Yeah, that's... It, it's a, it's a, people aren't thinking that way when they're in their tent and they're 
it was, I couldn't even, I've never grown in a tent and I couldn't imagine doing it. I, I, it just, it seems kind of foreign to me. I don't know why no, people just don't I, use the closet. Well, I, I can speak to that. Cause I, uh, you asked about Jeremy. Um, you know, Jeremy went from being a guy, I'm serious. And I'm, this is not a, a put down or the fact. Seven years ago, Jeremy was a poster at IC Mag who annoyed me with questions constantly. And in fact, to the point, one point I said, I hope you're writing this stuff down. Well, as it turned out, he did. Awesome. And in, in seven years, he basically killed the other two organic soil things you got to see his new video now man he's got black friday deals like you wouldn't believe he's going to do 12 days of christmas a video a day uh at the end of towards the end of december and then he's going to do uh he's been asking me for this for a long time and i i said i let me think about it anyway so we're going to do a one-on-one -on -one, um of how a bunch of silly post it uh Gypsy Nirvana. I want to see the birth certificate on that one. Uh, Gypsy Nirvana's uh, IC Mag, and then the other one, Grass City. Uh, I, I, okay, do you remember Roll It Up? Yeah, I, did. I just poked around on there a little bit. I was an IC Mag uh, person myself. I learned a lot from you on there, and I never bothered you with questions, but I just I, I did a lot of reading on there. If you knew where to look, it wasn't a bad resource. Not you at just all. You had to know where to look. You had to listen Not at to all. Bog and yourself and some of the other people on there that have actually done things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a trip, man. I remember, uh, oh, what's his real name? Oh, David Watson, uh, Sam the Skunk Man. He was, he was holding court, you know, talking about the Sea of Green. So... I have I have a library you wouldn't believe, and a lot of it's ancient stuff. And uh, what the stoners call Sia Green was practiced about four thousand years ago in China. And guess what? Raised beds where you plant your plants close to center, and that it reduces. Uh, um, oh, when the water goes up in the air, uh, evaporation. It reduces your evaporation. It reduces the areas for weeds to grow. It, later, it was modified, much later, uh, 14th century France. It was called the French Technique. And then uh, in the 50s, uh, Alan Chadwick, I believe, a Brit, he modified it and called it uh, the French Intensive Technique. And now John Jevons, at, who wrote the book, How to Grow More Plants Than You Ever Thought Possible. And I got that screwed up, but all those words are in the title. Okay. And this, that book's been around for about 45 years, maybe. Yeah. I, yeah. In fact, that's where I, I first uh, went to uh, in the 80s, mid 80s. I went to a three week class at his facility. But now it's called the uh, biointensive, not to be confused with biodynamic, but the biointensive method, double dig. And there's some other things that I think have kind of fallen out of fashion and should have. I think the last thing you want to do is disturb microbial colonies yeah. just to do a, a pro that's my own opinion, but you know, I mean, I wouldn't own a rototiller, you know, so I probably wouldn't do a double dig where you're replacing this 12 inch with the one below. That's yeah. They're flipping the soil layers. You're like, oh, yeah, cool that right. I would do that. Like, I like those yeah. forks though. Have you seen the broad forks? Like mm -hmm. those are a way I, um, that you can actually like loosen the soil lower down. Absolutely. Layers. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, we replaced all, our, we don't have a yard in our front. It's all raised beds. And uh, I always get neighbors. What do you spray your plants with? Uh, nothing. I just put some kelp in the, I mean, I've been working this soil for, maybe 16 years. And I brought in good soil because I live on a basalt ledge. So there was no soil. It's just rock. And uh, 
so I had to do, you know, uh, raised beds, and then I filled it with a really, really good. I've got to give them a plug. Uh, Dean Innovations folks over on Southeast Foster and I-205, as good as it gets, about $45 a yard. Tell them Coot sent you. Um, yeah, and then I just, I you know, I added all the basalt and my usual stuff, you know, kelp and uh, I know, oh, God, uh, malted barley, you know, and uh see what else. Oh, yeah, neem. In fact, I just put neem out for my garlic. So there you go. I really roll the dice here, you know. So just quickly, uh, just because I know uh, Allison has uh, a life to get back to outside of our little weed ecosystem. I've got a six-year-old that's going to crash through the front door like any minute now. <laughs> but uh, so I want to give Allison, you, you have some uh, some related to the initial topic of Mary Applehoff, author of such books as <laughs> Worm, what is it? Worms eat my garbage. And worms uh, eat yep. our garbage. Ah, the, 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 the edgy sequel. Uh, but uh, do, do you have any kind of parting? Uh, and I think specific to kind of, I think who her audience was, which is the home composter, just kind of like thoughts from that book or, or just your own thoughts, if you can't remember the book. Well, I mean, thoughts from the book are, like, I think there's a reason, right, that nobody has tried to write something similar for that audience, because it really is the definitive one. <laughs> um, so, like, if you're a home vermicomposter, and you want to get your toe in that door and start experimenting and learn just enough to make sure they don't crawl up your kitchen wall, right, like I had that one crawl up at the beginning, this, it's a really great place to start. And just the idea that, you know, people embracing a process within their household can help fuel like societal embracement of yeah, said process. Right. And I'm, I'm just curious, like I've learned so much in this live stream, like what would it take to get the cannabis industry on board with things like vermicompost? And I mean, I know people use a ton of different products like, yeah, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm coming away very surprised. I thought if any industry was going to be using it, it would be it, the cannabis industry. So like, how do we change that? How do we get people open to these just great, great sources of nutrients and beneficial microbes and everything else? It's hard to say because this man has been preaching it for over a decade that I know of. Like he's, yeah. he's been on the worm castings and, and singing their praises for a very long time. And it doesn't take much to make your own. Wait, you know, and, you know, it's really think, rewarding. Can, can, can I just jump in there for a second? I, I think it's interesting. I'd love to hear from the three of you. Like I look at my home worm castings and then I look at kind of like worm castings in a bag and I'm just like, I, I would never want to go back to that. No, I, I want to add one thing. Uh, and, and this is really, really important. I watched a documentary three or four years ago by the man who lived at the uh, headquarters of the Dalai Lama. He was the tea guy. And he traveled all over China, believe it or not, oolong tea, the good stuff in China, before he export fees and before the import fees on the other end, can run $5,000 a pound. This is, this is like hardcore, like what some people here want to do with their cannabis, you know, like the best. So the history of tea is really important here, but before it, it was even public, it was restricted to the royalty, to the uh, ruling family. You know what they fed those plants? A handful of vermicompost once a year. The amount that you could take it with two hands and that would be packed around the base. I think, I think there's an important lesson there. And remember, the two largest uh, empires that the world has ever seen were China and India. And India has been vermicomposting for yeah. the better part of 3,000 years. So somebody made a comment. Oh, no, Coot's going to say the same thing again. Yeah, sit tight, buddy. I mean, I haven't changed my mantra for... I think my first posting on IC Mag was 13 years ago. Um, yeah, something like that. And, uh, you know, it just gets dumber. 
you know, it's, no, it's, it's, it's equally done. We just new set of players. But the people that really I get emails from constantly, thank you very much. All I wanted to do was grow some plants for my father. You know, those kind of situations where, you know, nobody's trying sticking a gun in their head, you know, trying to rip them off. I, I don't I won't I won't work with commercial growers. I mean I, I don't care. You you go do whatever it is you're gonna do, you know. I'm not interested. Um but it doesn't take a lot. So in the back to the topic at hand, Mary's book, what's wonderful is that she has a set of plans in that book where you can build a worm bin out of one sheet of plywood, a four by eight. And that has been it was like open source, whatever the term is. So you can find it online. You don't, if you don't want to buy the book, okay, you can find the plants that show you how here's where you cut and here's how you put it together. I mean, it's amazing. So that's why I say her contributions can't be overstated. And uh, I think the next step up is uh, what I advocate is to use products like smart pots because they're made from uh, uh, post-consumer plastics, uh, water jugs and, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so uh, it, it doesn't deteriorate. And they breathe. And that's the big thing. When you own a worm bin, the big thing is how much air, because this is an aerobic process, how much air can you get in that bulk? And the more air you get, then you're going to have increased uh, reproduction. Because and that, uh, you know, the whole thing. And more bacteria act activity, so it means more food. More food means more worms. More worms means more castings at a faster rate. You know, it all goes, you know, hand in hand. But you don't need a lot of castings to see the benefit. You know, find out where you can get good compost in your part of the world. Make a wor uh, make a, a potting soil with that. And then as you progress, then you can add, like the Chinese did, small amounts of worm castings to... Hey, look, I know that I use too many. I mean, I get that criticism. I get it, you know, but nah, 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 nah. I got access to it, you know, for not very much money. Yeah. You know, so why not use it? So, yeah, I mix a soil 33, but you only need 15, 12, 10. I mean, you know, if you take care of business, you know, get some uh, good, what do you call it? Uh, 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 compost. You know, don't buy it from a grocery store. My God. You know, again, go talk to the farmers at your farmer's market. You know, find out where they're, maybe they got some to sell. Maybe they make their own. Hey, I'll, I'll sell you some. You never know. People are really helpful. Once you step away from a grocery store, you know. So, anyway, it was a pleasure meeting you. I, I really appreciate, uh, I know I didn't want to bore you, but I know you're familiar with all the work that Dr. Sherman did at uh, Cornell in conjunction with Cornell and the research that went on there with uh God what's he the guy out here in uh, Oh no that was me that's me I'm Allison uh Rhonda's at North Carolina State Oh right no I know yeah. I thought she did some research there with uh, Yasmin Cardoza when oh, she yeah, was working at, at North uh, NC State too well now yeah. she's, at, uh, she's at BASF but um yeah she was there as a professor for many years yeah, yeah so her Rhonda, work though yeah. Rhonda and Yasmin collaborated, and then uh, Tom and I collaborated. But we're all, we all like, it's a close knit worm family. So, <laughs> uh, what's amazing to me is uh, Dr. Uh, Cardoza's work is that it had long been, I wouldn't say long, but it had been established about the uh, fungicide properties yeah. of using uh, vermicompost. But she was the one that established conclusively the pesticide. Yeah. Uh, of properties that worm castings bring to the discussion. So when people tell me, Even well, I you know, they're a new species of entomopathogenic, uh, I believe fungus from the vermicompost like castings uh, that, that could, that had potential as like a biocontrol agent too. So not only the, the, you know, insect protection properties of the finished material itself, but she, she broke it down and found even literally like new species, new microbial species in there. Yeah. Yeah. I read, I read most of her papers. Well, I shouldn't say that. I tried to, I struggled through all the papers that I could locate. And so that part, I usually stuck with the abstract, uh, you know, the, the, the front page, like, okay, here's what we did. Oh, okay. 
I had the pleasure to... of meeting her at, at one of Rhonda's um, conferences, pharma composting conferences at NC State. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's great. Um, I'm well. I'm envious. It sounds like uh, you're in a really uh, just a great uh, area of, of uh, research. So, well, I wish I was still working directly with vermicompost. I hope I hope to again. I'm kind of out in the microbial sphere now, but I got a leaf. That was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and because I know it rolls off the tongue, uh, pink pigmented mess of. Ooh. Pink pigmented facultative methylobacteria. And when we get our field results back this season, I'll let you know. We'd, we'd maybe right. love to come on and, and chat again. So, What happened uh, with a few years ago, uh, the cannabis community was all agog because a certain product contained the uh, PNSBs. And then all of a sudden they were removed from the product and I never saw them mentioned again. So I just did they fall out of favor or... The purple non-sulfur bacteria, you know, I don't know. I didn't get it, so. I didn't get it why it was in the product in the first place, but that's just me. I have so. no idea what you're talking about. Uh, I, I think that I have a better answer for your question, Allison, before you go. I, the, you you got to find a way to make worms sexy for the cannabis community. But they mm. so are. How they, they yes, know? we know that, but they if don't. If you don't but, get it, I can't help you. Like, well, I, I, well, what sells in cannabis is like uh, I don't I don't even know if this holds true anymore is uh, winning competitions and stuff. But yeah. it, it could be just like somebody with a, a big name with a large following is like they they start pushing it. Like yeah. somebody that is that I'm not going to name any names and in, in specifically, but like oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, do you know how many people have made careers off of my gifts? I gifted them, you know, this plant that's going to be 39, so much for 39 years old in January, so much for genetic drift. Um, but, uh, I mean, I could name off 13, 13. They have seed companies. Oh yeah. Uh, this is the TO. I got it from, uh, the coot. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't take you to raise. I just gave you a, you know, a piece of plant. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, at least just, they, they say what it is. A lot of times they'll just change the damn name on it and oh, yeah. do that whole that whole game. So at least yeah. they're they're trying to claim that it's the TO. So yeah. it's, it's cool that you've got a new hybrid that you're messing with now. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's amazing some of the people you get a chance to work with when uh, you know no one's trying to run a play on the other people, you know, and. Uh, I mean, you know, I really believe this. It's just, you know, God, get over it, man. It's just a plant. And uh, the names don't mean anything. It's just, it's a marketing tool. It's like you go to the grocery store. Is there really a difference between the old Pepsi and the new, or Coke and new Coke or Pepsi? I mean, what? Yeah, I get it. Carbonated water, fructose. Yeah, all right. And uh, some caramel color. Yeah. All right. Well, this time right. of year, you can get the green cap with the real sugar in it. You can get the kosher yeah, Jesus. at that time of year. <laughs> okay, I want to say, especially because Allison has young children. And I've done my homework. The, the term natural flavors was a gift from Congress to the food manufacturers. It means exactly the opposite yeah. of what it sounds like. It has nothing to do with natural and flavors um it's like uh the uh cannabis product advanced nutrients it's um, oxymoron it's neither so um there you go so this you know i i uh been fighting and uh diabetes and i did one thing back in uh, august is i quit eating any refined foods including flour and i've been baking for 42 years and no refined sugar and i dropped my a1c over 30 percent in 90 days so uh you know and children you know it's addictive this uh this the sugar is uh well i'm not trying to tell you how to parent i just uh i've been studying it. it's really it's kind of frightening really like a can of coke is like like 40 grams of sugar i mean in my book that's close enough to one and a half ounces that's three tablespoons my god Jesus. So, 
Well, I really, you know, I, I, I wanted to tell you, you know, from a, uh, a very serious scientist, user scientist, I really appreciate the academic work that people like you and Rhonda Sherman and and I I just learned a few months ago that uh, Dr. Uh, Davis passed away this last summer. So yeah, Clive Edwards passed away. I'm sorry, Clive. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's uh, when when the book is written on vermicomposting in the 20th and the early 21st century. Well, you, or, you wrote uh, the book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I know. Yeah, you know, what I really liked about that book is that it's not a how-to as much as an anthology of how this works around the world. And yeah. and I think what it showed me is that it also got, got me oriented towards cold composting versus thermophilic composting. I mean, we could spend a long discussion on that, especially if you're working with leaf to create black leaf mold, and then you run that through a Burma uh, comp culture situation. And now you're talking some real, uh, biologically alive material uh and if you're doing potted plants i mean like uh not cannabis but uh say you know, like citrus trees originally were developed in china and they were grown in clay pots uh, and they sat on the patio and uh so if you're using, trying to create that type of soil the black leaf mold gives you structure for aeration and flow of water um, so there's just a whole bunch of uh, benefits to doing uh, what sometimes called uh, uh, cold composting. But see, that requires more work, you know. So well, I don't want to do that, man. I want if somebody's running around doing. Oh yeah, I can show you how to make uh, compost in three weeks. Well, please do. Yeah, it's not bring it on. Compost. Yeah, bring it on, man. <laughs> I'm ready. Well, you guys have inspired me. I I have my small tiny worm bin, but I'm not renting anymore. Like I I've, I've got a house. I'm gonna work on my husband and see if I can put a worm wigwam in the uh, in the garage. So wish me luck. The <laughs> wigwam. Get back into it. I I had great experience. With yeah, them. they're good. Uh, they're really good, and I just thought yeah. they're still available. I'm like, oh, I want one again. I yeah, think they're made in right. Oregon. So, yeah. so if Allison's husband is listening, this is what she wants for Christmas. That's what I want for Christmas. That's a good yeah. price, by the way. Yeah. So I know I knew the guys that were running that about six. I don't know if they still own it, but six years ago, I, I, I helped them. I led them to some people that could distribute for them on a bigger scale. So, yeah, they're uh, they're really good for small uh, restaurants uh to process waste because you know you pay to have that hauled away that you tra there's yeah. trash and then there's waste or your food stuffs yeah they're like an easy to manage mid-scale yes system. like i was when yeah. i was running one i was taking food scraps from like three or four of my neighbors and it was perfect for that so, so wish me luck, right. i hope all my holiday dreams come true and and like all of you like i'm so thankful for mary applehoff and everything that she added to this field and i think about all the people that she inspired and what everyone has been able to do and build off of what she started and it's really exciting so one last thing just please consider using the blues because okay. they reproduce at about 35 to 40 percent faster than red wigglers the fatita and um how do they do in the cold though Oh, you, you're going to have them in the basement? Well, I was thinking, like, I'm in St. Louis, so, like... Oh, no, never mind. Have it inside. Yeah, they're, they're more yeah. like the warm weather ones, right? Hey, cold weather here means it's dropped below 40. I know, you guys okay, stop so, rubbing it in, both of you. <laughs> okay. Are you talking Indian blues? Well, yeah, because they come from Kashmir, yeah. And, uh, they, uh, yeah, I can't remember. It starts with a P. The the, the the botanical name, but uh, well, isn't Kashmir like cold? That's northern India. Yeah, Kashmir. if it's if it's like high elevation, yeah, I'll, that, okay. I'll check out the temperature range on that. Well, here's what happens if you're interested. Okay, so you have a worm bin, and let's say you have three pounds, and that's gonna uh, that's gonna be like three thousand for this discussion. Let's say three thousand uh, worms. All right, so when the temperatures drop below uh, fifty. They huddle together to keep the body, uh, you know, and they go into hyper reproduction. They increase their uh, 
cocoon about 50% over normal. And so even if it drops down to freezing levels uh, and they all die, which has, can yeah, happen, cocoons, right? like, the cocoons can, can, can withstand temperatures down to uh, 30 below zero, I believe it is. Uh, they're going to verify that with Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Clive Edwards. So I'm kind of going on memory here. But anyway, so when the uh, the conditions come to the level of the temperature, they hatch and life moves forward. Yeah. So um, it's not a it's not a catastrophe if you if there were worms because they'll they'll uh, for self preservation they they will go into I mean you dig down in there after it gets really cold. And you look at the cocoons and it's like, wow, it looks like BBs or something in your soil. It's really, it's really fascinating to watch. So, and right, they, well, I'll keep you guys posted if I start a system up again. And again, it, it, it was great um, talking with everyone. And, and thanks so much for all you're doing to, to spread the word about these great technologies that are available. So I, I hope to see more, more pickup in the cannabis community because it's, yeah, it's great stuff. Well, thank right. you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming on and sharing your time with us. Thanks. I've got I've got the daughter outside. Literally, she's like, "Do you want to play with me?" So I gotta go. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have Thanks a happy so Thanksgiving. Guys. Take Bye. care. Happy Thanksgiving. All right. Yeah, well, some of the people of we were, some of the people we were talking about, have made contributions that it's unfortunate that their their names aren't common knowledge, like Dr. Yasmin Cardoza. And her research on the pesticide properties of uh, vermicompost. You know, you don't deal. You're not dealing with uh, fungus gnats and you know root aphids and all this other craziness. And uh, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you're not going to find good castings in a bag. It doesn't work that way. You know, this is a biologically alive material. So the further you, you get away from day one, you know, packing. Uh, you can start, you know, the clock starts. So absolutely right. So this, this thing's pushing three hours now, Peter. So you think it's time to wrap it up? We can, I, I got we a can, drive we, shaft. Yeah, yeah no, I, I love that it's gotten uh, dark, progressively dark where you live. Yeah, East Coast. Yeah, yeah that's it. It's, it's, the sun's setting over here. It's beautiful out there right now. I want you to wear this tomorrow when I... You got something to say? Yeah. You want me to wear those ones? Yeah. So she's fascinated with the... She was listening to you guys, and now she found my... Uh, these ones. Do you want to put those ones on? So anyway, I'm going to... Uh, is it bath time? Mm -hmm. Oh, Valentina, do you remember uh, yesterday morning we were dancing to who? His name's Peter? Peter. That's right, Peter Tosh. And what song were we listening to? <laughs> Do you remember? Into my heart, reggae my lightus. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have reggae my lightus? Yeah. Do you love reggae my lightus? Yeah. Does it make your little tushy shake? Yeah. Yes, yes, it Peter. does. Woo! All right. Peter yeah. Tosh. Peter Tosh. All right. Well, it is bath time here in SoCal. So Peter I think that's a. Okay. Peter. Well, here, can, can I wrap it up yeah. and then you can have them all you want? Yeah. You can even bring them upstairs. So yeah, why before you, you go to before Toot goes, I, I thank you for making my life easier. You've saved my back a hell of a lot of work. And just thank you so much for all the knowledge that you've spread with us over the years. So I was just I probably won't uh, be talking to you face to face like this again. So it's just I wanted to thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad that uh, you whatever that you found value in it that uh, help you grow better plants, whatever it is, you know. Um, yeah, you'll grow better tomatoes in the spring, you know. It's just the way it works. Yeah. Absolutely. And just, just quickly, we were talking about barley and things like that. And uh, yeah. I, I picked up uh, actually this morning at the farmer's market. Last year, I grew um, Sonora white wheat, which is this one. Uh-huh. And uh, so I'm going to grow some, <laughs> some barley and I want to grow some farro and then uh, either okay. rye or buckwheat and then sorghum in the uh, spring and summer. 
Um, let me just uh, the the uh, uh, Milo, or excuse me, the uh, the sorghum is also known as Milo. So if you want to find information on it, it's a one. Uh, I use it for uh, creating grain spawn for uh, growing mushrooms. Um, but but the sorghum you're supposed to grow in the summer, right? Like it's not. Well, yeah. It, if you if you go look at uh look it up online, what'll blow you away is that set the ears aside. It looks exactly the two corn in this plant look exactly alike, except they have different manifestations as far as uh, the grain. And uh, it's really big in livestock. In fact, in South Africa, they make a beer out of it. Um, I went to the trouble of getting a can of it, and uh, I probably wouldn't repeat that, but um, or do it again, I guess. Uh, but yeah, so and do you, the word malt, all it means is that you germinated it. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything else. So you can take any seed, and I did in the years that I was experimenting with this, and I sprouted uh, legumes. Everyone they had over Bob's Red Mill, I mean, the rare stuff. And I did all the grains uh, like these. And then somebody told me about you could buy this at a home brew store. And that was the last time I ever sprouted a seed. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought it was cool and groovy, but, you know, it was also really convenient to be able to go buy it and grind it up and mix it in my soil and call it a day, you know, so... Yeah, you'll like yeah. it. Yeah, you'll like it. It's really good. It's uh, really make your plants explode. It really does. Okay, Valentina is now listening to Peter Tosh reggae my lightus on. Uh, <laughs> she was like, "How come I can't hear the conversation when I put these in?" Do you like it? Yeah. Does it make you want to shake your? All right, I'll let you. Hey, listen, you guys have a great holiday and. Uh, Valentina, it was really nice to see you, and I hope you have a big big meal tomorrow. Hope you enjoy. Thank you for jumping right. on. Thanks a lot, Coot. All right, man. You guys take it easy. See All ya. Right. All right, Pete. You, you, you want to you wanna close it out with some parting words? Uh, the, start working with worms, people. They start. They work for you. And that's really all I have to say. Peace. That was short and sweet. So, uh, yeah, I thought we were going to have a uh, Marco and Brian show, but we're actually, it's, uh, they're taking the day off. So, uh, everyone have, I think we may have London later today, but I'm totally spacing out. But uh, everyone have a good one, and uh, we'll see you soon. And, and, and so, so in turn, sorry, I'm on this side. On this in side. terms of the uh, book club, we'll figure out what the next book is. I'll I'll try to get uh, um, Mel or Jim, <laughs> the other Jim, Mel Frank, uh, and see if we can do that one maybe next. That, yeah, those people were complaining. Is where's the weed books? So that's the, let's do a weed book. <laughs> Who is complaining? In the uh, chat? It, uh, yeah, I've seen a few chats. Really? It's the, the, the book club with no weed books. Uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, now. Anyway, right. yeah, she's <laughs> you got a Peter Tosh fan on your hands now. That's awesome. Yeah, you want more Peter <laughs> Tosh? Okay. How about uh, coming in hot? Okay, that was the other one you were dancing to. All right, that is all right. With that, do you wanna do you wanna I'm end hot. the broadcast I'm with your hot. newfound? All right. Hot. So uh, hit hit this red button twice, right? The big red button that says end broadcast. All right.